Good morning, everyone. Uh, the Subcommittee on Health will now come to order. The Chair now recognizes herself for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, and welcome to our colleagues that are at the table and uh, everyone that uh, uh, is here in the hearing room. Uh, today's hearing features House colleagues uh, who will present their legislative proposals to advance what I have always called the North Star of the Democratic Party, uh, and that is to achieve universal health care uh, for the American people. Uh, five members are, uh, or will be, at the witness table. Uh, two representatives, uh, Mr. Lujan and Ms. Schakowsky, will speak from the committee seats, uh, and two others, uh, Representative Cedric Richmond and Representative uh, Vesey uh, are submitting written statements. Every American should feel secure that if they get sick or if they're hurt, they will receive the care they need without going bankrupt. That principle is why President Johnson signed Medicare and Medicaid into law, despite the protests at that time that it was, quote, socialized medicine and the Moscow party line. Today, Medicare covers 44 million Americans and Medicaid covers 75 million Americans. Our goal to achieve universal coverage motivated Congress to pass the Children's Health Insurance Program in 1997. It's why President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act into law in 2010, which today provides health coverage to more than 20 million Americans. But we know there's more work to be done to achieve universality. During our second panel today, we will hear the stories of fellow Americans who live in daily fear that they'll lose their health care because of a decision by their employer, their insurer, or this president. My hope rises as I see uh, the talented colleagues before us who will present their proposals and broaden our thinking. That's why I specifically asked each to be here today. My hope rises as I look out at doctors, nurses, and patients in the audience who've dedicated their lives to achieving quality health care for every American. Advent is a season of hope and an appropriate time for colleagues on both sides of the aisle to approach this hearing with open minds and hearts, knowing that the goal is to have health care for every American. Shortly before his death, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy wrote a letter to President Obama about health reform and what he called, quote, that great unfinished business of our society. He wrote, what we face is, above all, a moral issue that at stake are not just the details of policy, but fundamental principles of social justice and the character of our country. I think we all need to reflect on that moral issue today. I now would like to yield the remainder of my time to Congresswoman Dingell. Is she here? Not here? Pardon me? She's on her way. She's on her way. Well, uh, we're going to move on because the chair is now going to recognize uh, Dr. Burgess, the ranking member of the subcommittee, uh, for his five minutes for an opening statement. Actually, before I start that, may I ask you a consent request? and ask consent to insert into the record the two letters that Mr. Uh, Baldwin and I sent asking for this hearing so ordered in the year. And also, I'm okay with you yielding your final minute and a half to uh, Ms. Dingle when she gets here. Thank you. So, um, thank you for convening the hearing. Uh, certainly Mr. Walden and I have requested this and we requested it very early in the year and I appreciate that you took our request seriously. So Chairman Pallone and Chairwoman Issue stated in noticing this hearing that universal health care coverage has long been the North Star of the Democratic Party. Every bill before us today is paving the road to the North Star, if that is even possible. The idea is we accomplish one size fits all health care. Uh, another Advent analogy, um, the three wise men, <laughs> not quite the same, but I'm not sure they'd appreciate your comparison as uh, this North Star journey would lead our health care system as we currently know it uh, to disintegrate. 
if in fact we're listening to the great philosopher Joni Mitchell, then the northern star is not very reliable as it is constantly in the dark. Medicare for all would eliminate private insurance, employer-sponsored health insurance, Medicaid, children's health insurance plan, upon which many Americans depend. I'm concerned about the consequences for existing Medicare beneficiaries. The policy would raid the Medicare trust fund, which is already slated to go bankrupt in 2026. This will not help. Our nation's seniors have been paying into and depending upon the existence of Medicare for their health care needs and retirement for literally their entire lives. More than 70% of Americans are satisfied with employers, their employer-sponsored insurance, which does provide robust protections. We should focus on strengthening the parts of our health insurance markets that are working. However, instead of building upon the success of our existing health insurance framework, a one-size-fits-all policy would tear it down. I also feel obligated to mention, having been in the health care provider business, a the doctor business, coverage does not equal care. It never has and never will. Single-payer health care would be another failed attempt as a one-size-fits-all approach to health care. Single-payer is in reality not, not one-size-fits-all. It's one-size-fits-no one. Single-payer health care would cost over $33 trillion for the first 10 years. This high price tag would require new tax increases. In fact, it would double the currently projected federal, individual, and corporate income tax collections in order to pay for it according to the Mercatus Center. So each and every one of these bills before us today is about Medicare for all and the pathway to socialized medicine. We have all seen the reports of increased wait times for patients in countries like Canada of up to almost nine weeks for a specialist consultation. Hospitals stand to lose billions under a Medicare for All plan. The New York Times reported rural hospitals saying that they would virtually close overnight, while others said that would, they would try to offset the steep cuts by laying off hundreds of thousands of workers and abandoning the lower paying services such as mental health services. We simply cannot afford the financial or human suffering that would accompany such a misguided policy. It's clear that this takeover of even one sector of the healthcare industry, um, we're going to be talking about later this week, prescription drugs in Speaker Pelosi's HR3 bill, and it would reduce the number of new drugs coming to the market. <clears throat> the Congressional Budget Office estimated between 8 to 15 new drugs would fail to come to the market over the course of the next 10 years. The Council of Economic Advisors anticipated as many as 100 drugs. Doesn't matter which figure you use everyone is in agreement that it would reduce new drugs coming that we've all wanted through innovation. I support common sense market-driven improvements to our healthcare system. Uh, the goal should be to increase access to healthcare services and drive down the cost for our patients. These universal healthcare coverage bills are all going in the wrong direction. In fact, I introduced H.R. 1510, the Premium Relief Act of 2019, which does include reinsurance that is coupled with a structural reform of the Affordable Care Act. This would give states more choice on how to repair their markets that have been damaged by previous legislative attempts. Even better, this legislation is fully paid for by stopping bad actors from gaming the system. There are policies that we could work on to get Americans to reduce their cost and complexity of health care. But we have before us today nine bills that fail to have a single Republican <coughs> co-sponsor among them. I'm glad we finally are having this hearing, Madam Chair. Uh, it's been a long time coming and some, certainly something we should have done as we started this year. Um, but at the end of the day, we really hope the Energy and Commerce Committee can open the blinds and reveal what the North Star really looks like completely in the dark. I yield back. Gentlemen. Gentleman yields back. I now would like to yield uh, the minute and a half uh, that I would. I, I want to yield to Congresswoman Dingle, so that you can make use of the time that you asked for. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Today we have the opportunity to discuss legislation that would, once and for all, address the cost and, ex and access issues that continue to deny millions of Americans the right to quality, affordable health care. 
every member of this committee has heard from, and every member of this Congress has heard from constituents who are fearful and frustrated by our current health care system. We've received letters and calls from individuals who face devastating financial hardship as a result of predatory health insurance companies enabled by our current system. And as I've always said, when I would take John to the doctor, it was like holding a town hall. Person after person would come up and share their stories that were just, they were people that were desperate and scared and needed help. We can and must do better. This is the promise of Medicare for All a comprehensive system of coverage that empowers all Americans. The Medicare for All Act of 219 would provide coverage for all Americans, improve traditional Medicare for seniors by offering additional benefits at lower costs, and utilize administrative efficiencies in negotiations to bring down prices. This is a historic day. I thank you, Madam Chair, for scheduling this hearing. We've never had a Medicare for All hearing in this committee, and I look forward to discussing this legislation further with our distinguished experts today and to keep answering questions and giving people the facts as we go forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Chair now recognizes uh, the Chairman of the Full Committee, uh, Mr. Pallone, for his five minutes uh, for an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Since the passage of the Affordable Care Act, more than 20 million Americans have gained the peace of mind that comes from knowing that they and their loved ones have health insurance. This landmark law resulted in the highest insured rate in our nation's history. It also expanded consumer protection so that no matter where you live or work in the U.S., your family would have access to affordable, comprehensive health care. The ACA ended debates of insurance companies price gouging older Americans, charging women more than men, and discriminating against people with pre-existing conditions. It not only prevented health insurance companies from discriminating against people with pre-existing conditions, it also required insurance companies to cover a set of essential health benefits like hospitalization, emergency services, maternity care, and substance use disorder services. It also eliminated annual and lifetime limits on coverage that for years had forced people with pre-existing conditions into bankruptcy. Thanks to the ACA, young Americans can stay on their parents' plan until they turn 26. The law also expanded Medicaid, which made health insurance available to millions of low-income Americans, including many with serious and chronic pre-existing conditions and unmet medical needs. Yet millions more would be covered today if it were not for the continued resistance of Republican governors to the law's Medicaid expansion and the repeated attempts by congressional Republicans and the Trump administration to undermine and dismantle the law. House Republicans voted 69 times to repeal the ACA. Luckily, they failed to do so, but they did repeal the law's individual mandate, increasing prices for everyone. Meanwhile, 20 Republican attorneys general and governors sued the federal government, challenging the constitutionality of the law. The Trump administration has taken the extraordinary position of refusing to defend the law in the courts. If the Republicans are successful in court, it would cause millions of people to lose their health insurance, eliminate protections for people with pre-existing conditions, and immediately spike health care costs for all Americans. I firmly believe that today we would be very close to universal coverage had it not been for the sabotage and for the refusal of Republican governors to expand Medicaid. I also believe that had the final law included the public option, as supported by the majority of this committee and the House at the time, that we would be even closer to universal coverage. Now, unfortunately, that's not the case, and millions of Americans remain uninsured, particularly in states that have refused to expand Medicaid. Also among the uninsured are undocumented immigrants and their families. When we drafted the ACA, I worked to include the undocumented, but I couldn't get the votes. And I'd like to know how the various bills before us today would address the undocumented. When people get sick, they make other people sick, so it makes no sense to exclude any group of people regardless of their legal status. And under the Trump administration, the uninsured rate has gone up and American families have lost coverage, including hundreds of thousands of children. We need to enact policies that include all the uninsured. And that's why we're here today. The bills we're considering reflect Democrats' continued commitment to achieving universal coverage and making health care more affordable and accessible for all Americans. I believe that we must continue to build on the success of the ACA until health care is truly a right for all Americans, which it should be. I look forward to the discussion and yield the balance of my time to the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky. Thank you so much. Today really does, today really does mark a landmark 
um, day to discuss ways that the United States of America can join the rest of the industrialized world in saying that health care is a right and not a privilege for all of our people. Um, you know, we spend more than any other country on health care right now, yet millions of people don't have access to care. We have the highest rates of infant mortal of maternal mortality. We have a shorter lifespan, and we can do better. Um, so I uh, have been a co-sponsor uh, and a supporter of uh, single-payer health care since a lot of you in this room were even born. Um, but I also want to say that I am a co-sponsor of every single bill that is going to improve health care in this country because we have to move forward. Um, I, the, uh, I, I, I'm a co-sponsor of a um, bi bicameral public option bill ever since uh, the Affordable Care Act didn't include it. I'm a co-sponsor, and you'll hear from Representative DeLauro on um, Medicare for America. Um, I am a, uh, a Medicare for All. Um, I'm an, I am a co-sponsor of that and was there at its in inception. So we don't know exactly what path we're going to take, but over the last 50 years, we have seen some dramatic changes. We have seen Medicare and Medicaid get passed. We've seen the ACA, and these are examples of the dynamic changes that we can make and that we should be making. We need to work together. Uh, Americans are asking us, begging us, to improve our health care system. They all want to be covered. We can do this, and we're going to hear about how we can do this today. I thank the panel, and I yield back. Gentlemen, yield back. Mr. Pallone? I'm sorry, yes, I yield back. Madam what Peter. are you dreaming about there? Dreaming Over about there. <laughs> dreaming about a better world. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, I now would like to recognize uh, the ranking member of the full committee, uh, my friend, uh, Mr. Walden, for Thank his you. five minutes. Uh, I want to join the chairman statement. in dreaming about a better world. It's that spirit we should have here this holiday season. Well, I believe it is. Yeah, I thank believe you it for, is. Uh, thanks for holding this hearing. I think it really is important to flesh out these issues and, and, and learn a lot about them. Uh, I, as you know, uh, our committee has moved forward on maternal mortality legislation. Uh, Ms. Schakowsky referenced that as a huge issue, and it is, and I'm glad we've moved forward on some of those specific issues. This is the committee that created Medicare Part D to help seniors get access to affordable prescription drugs uh, that had never been a part of Medicare before. We did that. The House passed it. I helped write it, support it all along. This is the committee that led the effort in a bipartisan way on 21st century cures. I know there's an effort beginning uh, to look at a Cures 2.0 so we can find these magic miracles that are saving people's lives and invest in American innovation and research. Um, this is the committee that uh, is on the cusp of uh, reauthorizing and fully funding our community health centers for the next five years. Um, I'm a big fan of our community health centers. When I chaired the committee, uh, helped lead the effort to uh, fully fund them. Uh, and Chairman Pallone and I are working together on uh, legislation to stop surprise billing so consumers aren't ripped off when they go to the emergency room. One in five are getting a surprise bill today. That's wrong. We're on the cusp of uh, dealing with that. Um, and we fully funded Children's Health Insurance Program in the last Congress uh, when I chaired the committee for 10 years. It had never been fully funded for more than five. So I think we all share a commitment to trying to find answers to the cost of health care, to access issues uh, when it comes for health care. Um, some of us, however, think that, that Medicare for All is not the right approach, um, that it would actually take away the health insurance 180 million Americans have today, many of whom have bargained for that health insurance as part of very aggressive union uh, employer bargaining agreements. They've traded away wages in order to have better health care or lower cost deductibles and all. Medicare for All would strip that away from them as it would uh, take away uh, Medicare Advantage plans and put it all under one system. And, and I'll just tell you, uh, when Washington politicians promise you something for, for free, um, you better hold on to your wallets. Um, as you know, 84% of Americans actually like the health insurance they have today. Uh, we all think it's probably too expensive. We all wish it were a little better. We can work to make uh, changes to uh, fix some of those issues. Uh, but one size fits all system that rations care and restricts access and blows a hole in the budget is, is not where many of us are at. At the presidential debate in October, a top Democrat said, and I quote, if you eliminated the entire Pentagon, every single thing, it would pay for about a total of four months, close quote. 
of uh, this uh, Medicare for All plan. These plans are so complex and confusing and costly that even the Congressional Budget Office could not figure out the price tag. However, two think tanks, one on the left, one on the right, came up with a range of between $28 trillion and $32 trillion over the next 10 years. Other versions we've heard about would cost upwards of $52 trillion. Even doubling the current, doubling the current personal and corporate taxes would not cover the costs, doubling. Doctors and hospitals could see payment cuts of 40 percent, 40 percent. How would they keep their doors open? What happens to our access to care? We can look north to Canada. The Fraser Institute did some research on this and found that a doctor's referral for specialty care, the medium wait time was 20 weeks, double what it was 25 years ago. That's a government-run system. Canada is facing a shortage of medical providers, and in some provinces, some hospitals have responded by actually closing their emergency rooms two days a week. British Columbia, 300 patients died waiting for surgery between 2015 and 2016 because of a lack of anesthesiologists. And according to the British Columbia Anesthesiologist Society, they say that's a huge problem. Canada has 16 CAT scans for every million people. In America, we have 45 for every million people. That means that you can get access to care quicker here, get those scans. Delay and denial of care is how government-run health care systems control costs. You see what's going on in England right now uh, with a young boy that was being treated, I think, in a hallway. Um, they ration care. They delay care. If the government decides the treatment or drug you need is not cost effective, you're denied access. We have that debate in this committee. The data are clear about how long you wait to get access to miracle drugs in, in other countries. Uh, upwards of 40 percent of the new drugs are not available. These are cancer drugs. These are new drugs on the market that would save lives and do in America. We've got to deal with the issue of cost, certainly, but there's a way to do that. And by the way, most of these government-run systems prevent you from going around the government-run system. Some people do flee a country, come to another one, mainly America, to get access to care when their own government system fails them. It's not just a theory, it's what happens in, in some of these countries. So I'm, I'm not a fan of, of that complete government takeover. I am a fan of reform and of making sure we have the network in place. Madam Chair, thanks for having this hearing. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, I just, uh, the Chair wants to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' uh, written opening statements shall be made part of the record. Um, and certainly the written statements of uh, the two members uh, that are part of the nine uh, proposals uh, that we're going to hear about today. Uh, so uh, they don't really need any introduction, uh, but I think that it's appropriate to uh, uh, still do so. Uh, it is, uh, it's an honor to welcome uh, our colleagues here today for, uh, for this hearing. Uh, each of them is going to speak for five minutes. Uh, to present their specific proposal. Uh, each one differs, and I think that, uh, as I said in my opening statement, uh, that uh, it's important for everyone to listen uh, because we have varying sets of ideas, uh, and I think that we need to have an open mind about them. Uh, so uh, beginning uh, with uh, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro from uh, um, my home state, where I was born and raised, uh, Connecticut. Welcome to you, uh, to uh, Representative uh, Jayapal from the state of Washington. Welcome to you, uh, to uh, Representative Higgins from New York. Thank you for making yourself available uh, today. Uh, to Representative Delgado from uh, the state of New York and Representative Malinikowski uh, from New Jersey. Welcome to each one of you. Thank you for the work that you've put into the product that uh, the legislation uh, that you're going to explain to us today. So we'll start with uh, Congresswoman uh, DeLauro. You're recognized for five minutes uh, to uh, speak to uh, your legislation, 1384, the um, Medicare for, no, 2452, I'm sorry, the Medicare for America Act. You all know the light system, so I don't need to. Uh, explain that to anyone. Thank you very much. Welcome. Great. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you so much. Uh, and to Chairs, uh, Congressman Pallone, to Congresswoman Eshu, Ranking Members Walden and, and Burgess, I'm delighted to be here this morning. It's a, an honor for me to join with the members of this uh, 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 committee uh, and also 
uh, to be uh, uh, with all of my colleagues here this morning on what is a critical, critical discussion on what are the pathways that we can move forward to universal care. I am here this morning to advocate for Medicare for America, which I first introduced with my dear friend and my colleague, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky. We did this in December 2018, and we reintroduced it this May. Uh, Medicare for America achieves universal, affordable, high-quality health coverage by creating a program based on Medicare and Medicaid. It covers all Americans through auto-enrollment starting at birth, while maintaining high-quality, affordable employer coverage. Medicare for America moves every individual currently enrolled on the individual exchanges and Medicare beneficiaries onto the program. Individuals and children enrolled in Medicaid and CHIP are transitioned onto Medicare for America over time to ensure that their care is not disrupted as we transform our health care system. We made this deliberate choice after working with members of the disabilities community who know all too well about disruptions in the face of budget cuts and other complications. For those with employer-sponsored coverage, two things can be true and are true. Employers have shifted many Americans to high deductible plans with less generous coverage. And many are very satisfied, including those union members, that negotiated very good coverage in lieu of wages in lean budget years. So Medicare for America allows high quality, affordable, private employer-sponsored coverage to remain or employers can enroll their employees in Medicare for America and continue to pay a contribution. Or those employees who work for these employers that continue to offer private coverage can choose <coughs> Medicare for America and their employer contributes toward the premium. This way, no one is locked into employer-sponsored coverage. Let me touch on something that I hear from most of my constituents, and that is cost. For individuals, seniors, families living below 200 percent of the federal poverty level, they will have no premiums and no cost sharing. There are never, uh, there are never any out-of-pocket costs for children under 21 and for maternity services, for preventive and chronic disease services, for long-term services and supports, and for prescription drugs. There are also zero deductibles, zero. Annual out-of-pocket costs are no more than $3,500 for individuals, $5,000 for families on a sliding scale. And premiums are capped no more than 8% of income for enrollees and are determined on a sliding scale. And additionally, on the topic of the cost of the program, our bill includes pay-fors. I ask you to read it. I won't enumerate all of them, but the pay-fors are there. Let me, discuss, let me discuss what is innovative about Medicare for America. Today, health care benefits are too dependent on your zip code. Universal coverage must be universal. So Medicare for America is explicit in the benefits covered, especially with respect to long-term services and supports. We're in a crisis. Families spend themselves into poverty to get the care their aging loved ones need. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of thousands of individuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities that wait years for services that may never come. So Medicare for America establishes the gold standard for long-term services and supports. We partnered with members of the disability community on the entire bill in order to ensure their needs. The resulting coverage, home health aides, personal attendant care services, hospice, care coordination, respite services, to name a few. We prioritized those supports and services for workforce development, raising the reimbursement rates for direct care workers and ensuring a career pipeline, credentialing, and worker rights. Then, in the interim, the bill recognizes the central role that family caregivers play by compensating them for their work, because it is work. Beyond the LTSS workforce, Medicare for America preemptively raises reimbursement rates for primary care and mental and behavioral health and cognitive services. Far too many individuals face roadblocks because reimbursement rates are too low. Far too many providers are weighed down or scared off because of mounting debt and choose only private insurance. So Medicare for America establishes all payer rate setting. Private insurance pays the Medicare for America rate. It all comes back to getting patients the care they need. That is why we ban private contracting. 
Current law allows providers to cover individuals uh, and, uh, medic uh, uh, and private coverage. They also talk about paying out of pocket for care, even if their insurance covers the benefit. It's a two-tiered system that must not continue. Patients deserve to be treated fairly, to get the care they need. Uh, we acknowledge the crippling of the student loan debt so that in many healthcare workers face, that often leads to private contracting. So we say to providers, pay our rates, see our patients, and we forgive 10% of your student loan. By making smart investments up front, the American people save a great deal of money in the long run. At its Rosa. core, um, uh, one second. <laughs> At its core, Medicare for America is about ensuring that every American has health care. And as we debate into the future on universal health care coverage, my view, Medicare for America is the best way forward in providing historic change. Amen. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Congresswoman DeLauro. With all the energy she always brings to everything that she does, uh, thank you. Uh, next, we, uh, we welcome and thank uh, Congresswoman Shiapal. She is the sponsor of H.R. 1384, the Medicare for All Act. Uh, and uh, so you have your five minutes to present your proposal. And thank, thank you. you again for being here today. I know that you have uh, judiciary as well, so uh, <laughs> away we go. Thank you so much, uh, Chairwoman Eshoo, Ranking Member Burgess, and Chairman uh, Pallone, and Ranking Member Walden, and distinguished members of the Subcommittee on Health. Thank you for holding this historic hearing. This is a great day. And let me start by saying that the Affordable Care Act was critically important in expanding health care for tens of millions of Americans across the country and, and providing insurance for those who had pre-existing conditions. But equally important, the Affordable Care Act allowed Americans to dream of a future where everybody had the right to health care. And for us, we need to ensure that we don't stop with the Affordable Care Act and that we get to the place where we have universal care for all people in our country. And that's why I'm so proud to have introduced, along with my esteemed colleague, Representative Debbie Dingell, H.R. 1384, the Medicare for All Act of 2019. Our 119 co-sponsors, over half of the Democratic Caucus, many of you on this committee, thank you for your input and your support as we developed this bill. This is now the fourth historic hearing we have had on Medicare for All in the House of Representatives. And that would not be possible without, without an enormous movement for Medicare for All. Um, and I want to particularly recognize quickly a few groups, Physicians for a National Health Program, National Nurses United, who you'll hear from today, Public Citizen, the Labor Coalition, the Disability Rights Coalition, and a Racial Justice Coalition and a Women's Coalition that worked with us for over six months to develop this piece of legislation. I would submit the most comprehensive and bold solution to fix our broken healthcare system. We simply wouldn't be here without their leadership. Our nation's healthcare system is the most expensive in the world. Contemplate that. This year, we will spend almost $3.9 trillion, or 18% of our GDP, on healthcare expenditures, and that is almost double what every other industrialized country in the world spends. Over the next decade, our current healthcare system will cost America about $55 trillion. What does that astronomical spending get us? The highest maternal and child mortality rates among our peer countries and the lowest life expectancy. It gets us 500,000 Americans who every year are forced into bankruptcy because of medical costs. It gets us 70 million people who still remain uninsured or underinsured. And that is just a bad deal. Why is America so far behind our peer countries? You might ask that because profit-making motives are baked into our system and our healthcare system incentivizes putting profits over patients. For-profit insurance companies with extremely high administrative waste stand between Americans and good quality, affordable healthcare. Every American knows someone, a loved one, a friend, a child, or a parent who has suffered a healthcare crisis, and they know that the system we have doesn't work. So how do we respond to this? I think if we really want to fix this, we have to do three things. First, any plan that proposes to fix our healthcare crisis has to cover everyone. Not just expand coverage for some, but cover everyone, guaranteed. 
Second, it has to provide comprehensive benefits and high quality health care when you need it. And finally, it has to take on the out of control costs, administrative waste, and for profit motive of the current system and bring down costs for American families. Our bill, H.R. 1384, is a 125 plus page bill, a comprehensive plan to lay out exactly how we get there, and it is the only plan that does all three of those things. Our bill improves the successful Medicare program that we have, but it expands it to cover everyone with a guaranteed government insurance plan, including comprehensive benefits, vision, hearing, dental, mental health, and of particular importance, long-term care for people with disabilities and older Americans. All of this with no co-pays, no private insurance premiums, and no deductibles. And because all doctors and hospitals will be in network Medicare for All gives the American people more choice than ever before. No more worrying about a massive surprise bill that you might get. No more worrying about what happens if you have to quit your job because you're too sick to work. No more worrying if you want to go start a small business, but you can't afford the cost of health care. H.R. 1384 also includes important cost containment measures to ensure that we rein in health spending. It bolsters rural hospitals and safety net hospitals with special provisions to help these hospitals stay open and thrive and have patients who are all insured. I want to be clear that every study, including the Koch brothers conservative study, says that we will save money with a Medicare for all plan. American families will pay 14% less than they currently pay in health care costs. And that's why over 250 economists sent a letter to Congress saying that Medicare for all is the right plan for our economy. It's why former CMS administrator under President Obama, Don Berwick, said that after being the director of Medicare for some, he now believes it's time for Medicare for all. And it's why 30 unions, for the first time, don't listen to the arguments that unions don't want this. For the first time, 30 unions, including the major unions, unions in our country have supported Miller. this bill. Now, it is up Miller. to us, and it is time for Wind us up. to pass Please. Medicare for All. I'm just listening to my mentor, Rosa DeLauro, who Let's took a going. minute more. <laughs> regular <laughs> order, yeah. regular yeah. order. Say that it is time just for us rip. to pass Medicare for All. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here today and testifying. We'll now uh, call on Congressman Brian Higgins. Welcome, Brian. It's wonderful to see you here, and you have five minutes to present your proposal. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Estu and uh, Chairman Pallone and Ranking Men Member Burgess. Uh, I just want to say that <clears throat> I was a proud supporter of the Affordable <laughs> Care Act, which will be 10 years old this March. But even the president, the speaker, recognized that the passage of the Affordable Care Act represented a start, not a finish, and that it was highly imperfect in many ways, including the lack of a public option to be a real countervailing force to private insurance. Because I think, by and large, private insurance screws people. They jack up premiums, they jack up deductibles, they jack up co-pays, and then when you go to use the insurance that you already paid too much for, there's very little underlying insurance. You know, before the Affordable Care Act, if you had a kid that was stuck with childhood cancer, an insurance company could deny you coverage because of a pre-existing condition. You can't do that anymore, it's against the law. And the only federal law that protects people with pre-existing conditions is the Affordable Care Act. And 2010, Democrats lost control of the House because of health care. 2018, Republicans lost control of the House because of health care. We're even. Let's move forward. I want to talk about three things. Complexity, cost, and leverage. The human body has 11 organ systems. There's 70,000 ways that those organ systems can fail. There's 4,000 medical procedures. There's 6,200 FDA-approved prescription drugs. There are 206 bones in the human body. There are 30 trillion cells and 200 cell types. The human body in healthcare is fascinating but complicated. The United States government pays $1.3 trillion for healthcare this year under Medicare, Medicaid, and the Veterans Administration. Then another 
$360 billion in prescription drugs. Uh, that's a lot of money. Uh, the federal government pays about a third of the entire, the nation's entire health care bill. But it's also a lot of leverage, and that's what I want to talk about today. All of these bills are outstanding. We need to make progress by using the best public option that already exists, and that's Medicare. Medicare has been around for 54 years. Uh, it is wildly popular with those who have it and those who provide services uh, for those who have that as their health insurance. 96% of Medicare beneficiaries have access to both the primary care doctor and a physician specialist. And all of the hospital institutions take Medicare as well. I have a bill that would allow people 50 to 65 to buy Medicare as a medical option. The Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation that has done extraordinary work in this regard says that 77% of the American people support a Medicare buy-in 50 to 65. Why that age demographic? Because this age demographic, 50 to 65, is to this century what the traditional Medicare population was to the previous century, and that is that private insurance had every opportunity <laughs> to write policies for people that were older and sicker but chose not to do it. And a good and generous nation responded by establishing the Medicare program. And then all the privates wanted in on it when it was deemed to be profitable and successful under the Medicare Advantage program. This age demographic experiences uh, very high uh, pre-existing conditions, about 50%. Their premiums are very high, their deductibles are very high, and their co-pays are very, very high. I'll give you an example. A 60-year-old able to buy into Medicare at their own cost that will not adversely affect the Medicare Hospital Trust Fund, according to the Rand Corporation and the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation, would save 48% when compared to a gold plan on the individual market. Now, Rand also said that six million Americans would take advantage of that plan. That's almost 14,000 people per congressional district. And I would remind you that that age demographic also votes. So it's good on the politics, it's good on the substance. I think we have an obligation uh, too much like we said 10 years ago, we need the next iteration, the next exciting iteration of Medicare expansion, and I believe that my bill uh, should be in that conversation relative to that goal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, and uh, uh, thank you for uh, being on time as well. <laughs> uh, on time uh, with your... Uh, uh, conclusion using your five minutes. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome and thank uh, Representative Delgado from New York uh, to present uh, his idea, his proposal, which is uh, HR 2000, the Medicare X Choice Act. So uh, welcome. Thank you. And thank you, Chairwoman. Sure. Issue. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Ranking Member Burgess, uh, Chairman Pallone. Uh, it is really nice to be with you all. Uh, this afternoon or this morning. Uh, I'm pleased to see the committee considering my bill, the Medicare X Choice Act, uh, and I'm honored to have the opportunity to uh, explain why it is a, a priority of mine. The title of today's hearing, uh, Proposals to Achieve Universal Health Care Coverage, a uh, urgent need indeed. We are the richest nation in the world, and yet the only developed one without some form of universal coverage. If unable to qualify for Medicare, TRICARE, or Medicaid, Americans are left to fend with a system that is entirely beholden to the profit motives of the private insurance marketplace. As a result, millions of Americans are priced out of the market and left uninsured or have insurance but simply can't afford to take advantage of it. It's unacceptable. We have got to achieve universal health care coverage. And I believe we can get there with a public option. I promised my constituents I would pursue this path. And with that promise in mind, this spring introduced the Medicare X Choice Act, 
along with my colleagues, including Representative Higgins and Larson's. Medicare X establishes a public option, a government-run insurance plan available in the marketplace for anyone to buy if they're uninsured or unhappy with their current plan. The effect of a public competitor in the private insurance marketplace will undoubtedly bring down the skyrocketing costs of premiums and deductibles. The plan starts in rural areas where coverage options can be scarce and it automatically enrolls every child in the CHIP program. Critically, Americans who like their current plans, like many union members who have spent years bargaining for what they have now, or seniors on Medicare Advantage, can keep them. This plan covers every American in just three years. It also attacks the underlying affordability crisis that plagues families across the country, an issue not discussed nearly enough. We start by one, requiring Medicare to negotiate drug prices. Two, increasing federal support for those who need it by eliminating the subsidy cliff for Americans above 400% of the federal poverty line and increasing the tax credit for those individuals below it. And three, authorizing 30 billion over three years for a national reinsurance program. Under this bill, a family of four with an income of $101,000 would see their premiums cut in half we do all that without costing the federal government a dime. The Congressional Budget Office recently found that Medicare X would actually add money to the Treasury over time. Medicare X fulfills the promise of the Affordable Care Act, that health care coverage will be simpler, more accessible, and more affordable when families can choose the plan that works best for them. Every time I've held a town hall, and I've held quite a few, I hear from folks about the costs of health care. Congress needs to get this done so families don't have to choose between paying medical bills or buying groceries. As this committee considers the health care legislative options, I hope you will find two main takeaways from my testimony today. More choice, lower costs. Two concepts I hope everyone on this panel can get behind. I thank the committee again for your time and the opportunity to share my priorities with all of you. We thank the gentleman. Uh, it's a great source of pride uh, uh, to all of us that uh, of the uh, five that are uh, uh, speaking at the witness table this morning, uh, that Mr. Uh, Delgado and Melanowski are new members of Congress. This is their first term. And uh, you are a source of pride to us. And uh, you more than hit the ground running uh, with ideas. You're fresh off uh, the campaign trail. And uh, it is, um, uh, it's always refreshing uh, to uh, see what uh, new people bring to the Congress. So thank you, as a combination with, uh, with the others. Thank uh, you. Now it's a, um, it's a pleasure to both welcome and recognize Mr. Melanowski for your five minutes to uh, talk about your proposal, which is H.R. 4527, the Expanding Healthcare Options for Early Retirees Act. Thank, thank you so much um, for those kind words, uh, Chairwoman Eshoo, Mr. Uh, Ranking Member uh, Burgess. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today alongside my colleagues, each of whom have put forward thoughtful proposals to get us closer to that North Star of universal coverage. Uh, and speaking of North Stars, Mr. Burgess, um, Joni Mitchell is Canadian, which means she comes from a country with lower health care costs and higher life expectancy. So I'm hoping you might have her for the next panel to answer some of Mr. Walden's concerns. <laughs> All right. Um, Chairman Pallone, I uh, also want to thank you for, for your leadership um, and your work with Mr. Walden, especially on the surprise medical billing issue. Let's please get that passed um, before we go home for the holidays. That would be a huge win, I think, for all of our constituents. I'm here to talk about a bill that I also hope that we can find common ground on. Um, my bill, the Expanding Health Care Options for Early Retirees Act, would allow retired first responders, firefighters, police officers, EMTs, to buy into Medicare beginning at age 50. Due in part to the physically demanding nature of their work, first responders often retire earlier than other workers and can experience 
gaps in coverage until they become eligible for Medicare. This legislation would close that gap. Coverage under this bill would be identical to the coverage provided under the existing Medicare program. Retirees would be eligible for tax credit subsidies and tax advantage contributions from their former employers or pension plan. Further, the bill specifically requires that it be implemented in a way that will not harm the existing Medicare program beneficiaries or trust fund. We're grateful to have the support of the International Association of Firefighters, the Fraternal Order of Police, the National Association of Police Organizations, the National Sheriff's Organization, uh, Association, the National Troopers Coalition, the International Union of Police Associations, the National Conference on Public Employee Retirement Systems, Ask Me, among other organizations, many of their representatives are with us today. And since introducing the bill in September, my office has received dozens of phone calls and letters and messages from people all across the United States describing how it would help them or a family member. A person from Wilson County, Tennessee wrote to us, this is such a needed law, more and more agencies are washing their hands of ensuring first responders when they retire. It is not a young person's job. And when we retire, we are damaged physically and emotionally and need the health care that eats up most of our pension. A paramedic from Florida wrote, I am 53 and can retire in two years. Health care has been my major concern after my retirement. I pray for all of you working on this proposed bill. A paramedic firefighter from Oregon wrote, I was born to be a firefighter in the community I was born and raised in. You naturally never think about your body wearing out. I've had several Toradol and steroid shots in both my elbows, shoulders, and neck over my career so that I can be at work answering my community's calls. It would be so helpful being eligible for Medicare benefits when I retire. A news paper in Texas quoted the head of the Abilene Police Officers Association saying the bill would allow us to retire at a good age and be able to afford health care. This affords us the opportunity to retire earlier, spend more time with our families, and enjoy life. This is why we are here today, examining how to improve our health care system so that every American can spend more time with our families and enjoy our lives so that we can choose a profession we love and to change it when we please without the crushing existential anxiety that comes from being uninsured or underinsured, without the fear that an accident or illness could lead to bankruptcy. Now, I believe that everybody who wants Medicare, teachers, caregivers, coal miners, farmers, service workers, everyone should be able to live with the dignity and security that the program provides. But as we debate how to free every American of the anxiety of dealing with the current health care system, let us at least do something to free the few, the dedicated and brave few who risk their health and their lives to protect us. Thank you so very much. I yield back. The uh, gentleman yields back. And uh, uh, let me express on behalf of uh, all of the members of the committee, both sides of the aisle, uh, for not only accepting our invitation to uh, uh, be here today to describe your idea, your uh, legislative proposal, uh, but the clarity um, uh, in which uh, you have done so. Uh, we, we're legislators, we're lawmakers, uh, and uh, it's incumbent upon us to um, respect the thinking that goes into each person's proposal. And uh, your thoughtfulness uh, is on display this morning. I know that uh, two of our colleagues have left, uh, but I, 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 my uh, kudos to each of you, all five of you. Uh, so thank you for spending time with us here this morning. And uh, now you can go on with uh, the rest of your uh, full schedule for the day. And uh, uh, the staff will prepare the table for uh, the second panel of witnesses. And uh, you can come. Let's see, we need to change the, uh, the name tags at the table so that they know where they're sitting. But can we do that with some sense of timeliness? Who's going to do that on the staff? All right, let's get to it.
Maybe everyone can check their phones while we're waiting. Are you expecting a call? <laughs> no, I'm not expecting a call, but people like to see what messages they've received. <clears throat> Isn't that, I, I know it, look at that. Careful, yikes. I thought they were. Okay, we're now going to hear from our second panel of witnesses uh, on this uh, uh, all important issues. And we welcome you, we thank you for making yourselves available to us today. Uh, first, Ms. Sarah Rosen. Uh, Baum. She's a health law and policy professor at the Milken Institute of Public Health at George Washington University. Welcome and thank you to you. Mr. Peter Morley, patient advocate, thank you to you and welcome. Ms. Jean Ross, uh, the president of the National Nurses United, welcome to you. Uh, Dr. Douglas uh, Holtz Egan, president of the American Action Forum. It's nice to see you again, and thank you for being here today. Dr. Scott Atlas, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution uh, at Stanford University, which I have the uh, privilege of representing. Thank you, uh, and it's wonderful to see you again. Uh, so we will now, uh, uh, I will now recognize uh, Ms. Rosenbaum for your five minutes of testimony, and uh, you can begin. I think you all know what the lighting system is, green. Uh, when you see the yellow light, um, speed up, uh, because on the heels of the yellow light comes the red light. Uh, welcome, and you may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Burgess and members of the subcommittee for this opportunity. Do you have your microphone on? Uh, yes, I do. And if, yeah, get it yeah, close get so we all can hear you very well. Every word. Over the past half century, Congress has pursued various solutions in its effort to ensure all Americans. As the limits of what could be achieved through a voluntary employer insurance system became evident, especially for the elderly, the poor, uh, uh, and low-income people and people with disabilities, uh, we've embraced over many years a range of solutions ranging from a single-payer solution in the case of Medicare to efforts to strengthen public and private insurance uh, and expand our largest public health program, Medicaid. Much work remains to be done, uh, and of course this work takes place against a backdrop of the highest cost health system among wealthy nations. After years of progress, the number of uninsured is growing again, and millions more underinsured because costs are too high and coverage is too limited. Using an incremental payer approach, the American, uh, excuse me, the Affordable Health Care Act, the Affordable Care Act accomplished a great deal. Immediately before the law took effect, 44 million people were uninsured. By 2016, the number had dropped to 26.7 million. Progress occurred at all income levels and in all states, but especially among lower income people and, of course, in the ACA's Medicaid expansion states. Preventive coverage has improved markedly, and coverage has improved for children and adults with disabilities. People with serious health conditions have benefited from the law's essential health benefit rules that broaden coverage and limit out-of-pocket exposure while promoting actuarial value. 54 million Americans have benefited from the protection against pre-existing condition exclusions and discriminatory coverage practices. Medicare prescription drug coverage has improved. 2.3 million young adults have coverage through their parents' plans, and community health centers have doubled their capacity. 
But now the latest census data show that we're moving backwards. The percentage of uninsured Americans is growing from 7.9% in 2017 to 8.5% in 2018. We're up to 27.5 million uninsured children and adults. The Trump administration is championing a lawsuit that could disinsure over 20 million people overnight. 14 states remain without the Medicaid expansion and over 2 million people are caught in this coverage gap, ineligible for Medicaid but too poor for tax subsidies. Other administration initiatives are aiming to push Medicaid enrollment still lower through block grants, work experiments, and other administration strategies. The administration has targeted the private insurance reforms under the ACA uh, in order to erode access to higher value policies in favor of what experts call junk insurance while taking constant aim at the law's essential health benefit and affordability provisions. I think that we face two major challenges, uh, one set in the near term uh, and one set for a longer term discussion, uh, and they are reflected in the amazing range of bills you have before you today uh, and the deeper thinking that's gone on behind those bills. The first is to what I would call staunch the flow. We need steps to redouble the effort to incentivize the Medicaid expansion where it's not happened. Uh, and people who depend on subsidized private insurance need more help. Uh, the ACA insurance market needs to be stabilized in order to promote affordable coverage. That's an immediate set of needs. In the longer term, you face bigger decisions, as you well know. What is the best mix of public and private insurance coverage? Do we preserve employer coverage? Do we maintain multiple programs or consolidate various public programs into one major alternative? Uh, if we move in this direction, should this program be open to employers and individuals or just individuals? Uh, and should it remain, um, and instead, should we c retain multiple public programs with various targeting built in? Uh, how broad should public coverage be? Should it subsume long-term care? Should we use auto enrollment to cut down on churn? What is the best approach to financing reform? And in order to achieve true health equity, do we need to think beyond coverage itself and also focus on community level investments in order to ensure accessible health care and a broad continuum of health promoting policies? Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Thank you. Um, it's so wonderful to have people widen the lens. Uh, welcome again, and thank you, Mr. Morley. Uh, you have five minutes uh, to offer your uh, testimony. Um, oh, I have oh. No, sorry. Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> thank you, Chairwoman Eshoo. Uh, ranking Member Burgess and members of the subcommittee. I am honored to speak with you today on my 28th trip to DC since July 2017 to fight for health care. My name is Peter Morley. In 1997, I had an injury during a lapse of insurance coverage. All treatment and medication costs were paid out of my own pocket. When I later needed surgery, my insurance company considered my injury to be a pre-existing condition, and my claims were denied. It was a financial burden totaling in tens of thousands of dollars. In 2007, I was permanently disabled from an accident. I was spared the costly medical bills of four spinal surgeries because I had continuous health coverage. In 2011, I survived kidney cancer and fought my way into remission after losing part of my right kidney. In 2013, I was diagnosed with lupus, which causes me severe fatigue, and most, day, it, most days it's a struggle to get out of bed. I now manage over 10 pre-existing conditions, take 38 different medications, and receive 12 biologic infusions to slow the progression of my disease. I live on the brink of financial ruin and only live modestly thanks to insurance and the fact that I can't be discriminated against because of a pre-existing condition. Pre-existing conditions are a way of life for me as well as millions of others. Most people like me with chronic diseases can live happy and productive lives, but only if we are provided access to health insurance that can't be taken away from us because an insurance company decides it's in their best interest not to cover something. Or if Congress decides to repeal our insurance, 
or if the Trump administration sabotages and refuses to, de to defend the Affordable Care Act. As someone who spends the majority of my waking hours in doctor's offices, the ACA has meant focusing on healing, not bankruptcy. I did not ask to be chronically ill. I used to be very private about my health, but once President Trump was elected and set to repeal the ACA, I could no longer be silent. In December 2016, I decided to foster awareness for lupus and advocate for health care. My congresswoman, Carolyn Maloney, has taken up my cause and those of people like me. In the last two and a half years, I have traveled to DC 27 times. I have collected the healthcare stories of thousands of people who shared their personal stories and concerns with me. I have held over 350 meetings with Democratic and Republican members of Congress alike. Many of you actually sit here in front of me today. My message is simple. If you think people don't get hurt when this administration doesn't defend the ACA, think again. We do, I do, millions do. And if you think pre-existing condition protections are not important, remember someone you love could have an accident, be diagnosed with cancer or lupus at any time, and that will change how you think about this. I know firsthand that your healthcare can change in an instant. This past July, I testified for the late Congressman Elijah Cummings. He thanked me for taking my pain, turning it into a passion to do my purpose. I will never forget those words. So today, in the spirit of our beloved Congressman, I have an ask of this entire subcommittee, please, work together to make health care of all Americans your passion. I put my health at great risk to travel here and share these stories. I never know if this is the last time I'm healthy enough to come to DC. But I'm here today to ask you to protect the ACA so we can enhance it and move towards universal health insurance for all Americans. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer your questions. What an honor to have you here. Thank you for your courage and your tenacity. Uh, it really is an honor to uh, have you here. Uh, and uh, we're going to do everything to help keep you healthy. Uh, and um, uh, I'll never forget your testimony and your words, just as you will never forget uh, uh, our late uh, Elijah Cummings. Uh, and now it's a pleasure to um, uh, recognize uh, Ms. Jean Ross, uh, the president of the National Nurses uh, United, uh, for your five minutes of testimony. Thank you again for being here uh, and uh, uh, for what you will say. So you're recognized. Good morning and thank you, uh, Chairwoman Eshoo, Ranking Member Burgess, and members of the subcommittee for inviting me to testify today. My name is Jean Ross. I've been a registered nurse in Minnesota for 45 years, and I am president of National Nurses United, the largest union representing bedside nurses in the United States with over 150,000 members. In my testimony today, I want to illustrate two main points. First, our current patchwork system of public programs and private for-profit insurers is ineffective, inefficient, and financially unattainable unsustainable. Second, the only way we can guarantee every person living in this country receives the care they need is by adopting a single-payer Medicare for All system. Every day, nurses witness the failure of our current health system. I've watched as patients don't seek the care they need because they can't afford their co-pays or deductibles or don't have insurance. I've watched as insurers refuse to cover the care that my patients need. Over many years, I cared for countless patients who showed up in the ER with severe illnesses only because they could not afford preventive care. One patient always stands out to me. He arrived in the ER in a hypertensive crisis. We treated him for an imminent stroke. I learned he was rationing his blood pressure medication. Instead of taking it every day as prescribed, he was taking it every two days. He knew he needed to take those pills daily but he could not afford the medication even with his private insurance plan. 
As a nurse, I have so many stories like this, but I'm also a mother and a grandmother, and this broken system has affected my family too. My son Tony suffers from a leaky heart valve. For the past 15 years, he's been consistently unable to afford the cardiology care he needs, so he just doesn't see his cardiologist. As a nurse, I know that this valve could lead to heart failure. As his mother, I live with the constant fear this could happen to my son because the health system I work in is failing him. My daughter is a single parent and she struggled to afford the co-pays for my grandchildren's care. When my grandson Evan was an infant, my daughter called me because he was sick. She wanted my advice as a nurse. She didn't have the money to take him to the doctor. I told her I would pay the copay because I knew that Evan needed immediate attention, medical attention now. Indeed, he was suffering from encephalitis, which is an inflammation of the brain, which can cause permanent brain damage and even death. I am so grateful that I had the economic resources to help because if I hadn't, like so many other patients who don't have the means, Evan would have been in severe trouble. As a grandmother, I want to leave my grandchildren with a country where health care is a right, where they know when they or their children get sick, they will only have to worry about their health and not the cost. As a nurse for 45 years, I know these stories are not unique. 30 million people have no health insurance, an additional 44 million people are underinsured. Yet, the U.S. spends more money on health care per capita than any other nation in the world. But despite paying top dollar for our health care, we get poor results. Our country ranks poorly on many international health indicators, including average life expectancy, infant and maternal mortality, and death from preventable diseases. High cost and poor health outcomes persist because access to insurance is not the same as guaranteed health care for all. This brings me to my second point. Single-payer Medicare for all is the only way we can guarantee health care while also reducing the amount of money we spend on health care overall. Under Medicare for all, we will transform our profit-driven health system, insurance system, into a health care system, one that prioritizes patient care. Everyone will receive quality, comprehensive, therapeutic care without any financial barriers. With Medicare for All, doctors and nurses will be able to provide care based on our professional judgment without insurance company interference. We'll have better patient outcomes and we'll save money too. As you consider different options to improve our health system, I encourage you to consider the following questions. Will this proposal guarantee safe therapeutic health care to every person in the country regardless of their ability to pay? Will it allow people to get health care independent of where they work or if they have a job? Will it reduce administrative complexity and waste in this system and control costs? There is only one bill before the subcommittee today that will achieve all of these things. H.R. 1384, the Medicare for All Act of 2019, authored by Congresswomen Jayapal and Dingell. The primary responsibility of a registered nurse is to protect the health and well-being of her patients. In my professional judgment, the only way we can put our patients first, as we're ethically and morally bound to do, is through Medicare for All. I urge every member of Congress to support H.R. 1384. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ross. It's now a pleasure to recognize Dr. Uh, Holt Egan, who uh, is, uh, you're recognized for your five minutes of uh, uh, testimony. And thank you again for joining us today. Chairwoman Eshoo, uh, Ranking Member Burgess, and members of the committee, thank you for the privilege of being here today to discuss these proposals for progress toward universal coverage, which is a, indeed a, and a very important goal for the United States. Uh, the, the proposals fall into two broad categories, as you've heard. Uh, some are like Medicare for all, sweeping single-payer uh, reforms uh, which would um, uh, cover everybody in the United States, and then a series of more targeted reforms uh, that, that take the character of uh, Medicare buy-ins, Medicaid buy-ins, and, and public options. So I want to discuss them in turn. Um, uh, the proposal for Medicare for All is a, uh, a, a truly um, sweeping reform, unlike any single payer elsewhere on the globe. Uh, other single payers do not ban private insurance, indeed often supplement it, uh, do not uh, eliminate a role for regions and states, but often rely on them uh, to, to deliver uh, this, their uh, health care and their insurance. Uh, they don't eliminate co-pays and other uh, incentives for individuals to utilize care effectively. 
Uh, and in one case, uh, Britain, they actually own and operate the hospitals. Um, um, in this case, uh, that no such thing goes on. So this is, this is not something where you can say, we're going to get something that looks like something elsewhere in the world. This is like nothing else that has ever been proposed. And it has embodied in it, inevitably, some serious trade-offs. Uh, among them will be uh, the trade-off between covering folks in this manner and access to care and the quality of that care. Uh, in the data, it is quite clear that as hospitals try to reach higher quality goals, they can be more successful the larger the fraction of commercial payers they have in, in their uh, uh, patient base. Um, that, that relationship between the rate of reimbursement and, and the quality of the care is, is quite strong and important in the research. These proposals would diminish the rate of reimbursement for, for hospitals and thus would uh, inevitably de degrade the quality of that care. In the extreme, one would worry that the reimbursements would be so low that hospitals could not actually uh, be able to remain open and thus diminish access to care entirely, which is, which is obviously counter to the basic intention, but it's something that needs to be dealt with in these proposals. The easiest way to deal with it, of course, is to reimburse at higher rates, but that's going to be extraordinarily expensive. As proposed, uh, the, the Medicare for all is, is on the order of 30 trillion, estimates are 32, 35, you uh, get in that ballpark. To give you a flavor for what that means as a matter of public finances, uh, if you were to finance that in the traditional fashion of Medicare with a payroll tax, you would need to have a 21 percentage point increase in the payroll tax, according to a Heritage Foundation study. Um, and in doing that, the additional payroll taxes would be outweigh the, the savings in health premiums for two-thirds of American households. So they would financially be worse off by the imposition of this uh, proposal. And, and to what end? Uh, the goal, obviously, is universal coverage, but if you look at the, the 30 million odd uninsured individuals in America, half of them are already eligible for an important public program, the ACA, Medicaid, or CHIP. Others are, are turning down an offer for employer-sponsored insurance. They haven't offered that. Indeed, if you can identify the, the group that really you might be able to get, it's about two and a half million individuals who are relatively low income and did not uh, reside in a Medicaid expansion state. Is it worth overturning the enormous heterogeneity and rich complexity of the U.S. healthcare system for two and a half million individuals? There's got to be a, a better way to do that. Some of the other approaches are more targeted. So for example, uh, there's a Medicare buy-in proposal that you heard uh, Congressman Higgins describe. Uh, we've taken a look at that at the American Action Forum, the, the think tank that I run. Uh, and in our estimate, um, uh, that, that bill would get about 293,000 Americans to buy Medicare buy-in the first year. By the end of 10 years, it would be down to about 170, 187,000 individuals. To the extent that there are increases in coverage from that bill, it comes from adding additional funding to the existing ACA channels. But even with $180 billion in additional federal, federal money, total coverage only rises by about 500,000 individuals. So we have these two approaches, a, a sweeping turnover of the American healthcare system to little gain, and some pr approaches that are targeted, but probably not very effective. And so I'd encourage the committee to continue to search for ways to get to universal coverage, but these don't appear to be the way to go. I thank you and look for the chance to answer your questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, 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 welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Atlas, and uh, you have uh, five minutes to present your uh, testimony. Thank, thank you, you Chairwoman. again for accepting our invitation to be here. Okay. <clears throat> thank you, Chairwoman Ashu, Ranking Member Burgess, and members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to speak today. The overall goal of U.S. health care reform should be to broaden access for all Americans to high-quality medical care, not simply to label them as insured. The notion that single-payer health care represents a goal for health system reform is mainly driven by the attractiveness of a simple concept. The government explicitly, quote, guarantees medical care. In England, the NHS Constitution explicitly states, quote, you have the right to receive NHS services free of charge, unquote, despite taxing citizens $160 billion per year. The opposition to single-payer care, though, should not focus only on massive new taxes that will be required, but instead on the well-documented half-century of its failure in the medical literature to provide timely, quality medical care. The truth is that single-payer systems, including in the UK, Canada, Sweden, and other European and Nordic countries, impose shockingly long waiting times for doctor appointments, diagnostic procedures, drugs, and surgery that are virtually never found in the United States, specifically as a means of rationing care. Indeed, the Supreme Court of Canada in the 2005 Chauli decision famously stated, quote, access to a waiting list is not access to health care, unquote. 
Barua calculated that over a 16-year period, over 44,000 additional Canadian women died due to Canada's imposed wait times for medically necessary care. In England alone, a record 4.2 million patients are on NHS waiting lists, 100,000 of whom have been waiting for more than six months for treatment after receiving their diagnosis. The average Canadian woman, maybe not Joni Mitchell, waits five months for her GP visit to her treatment by her gynecologist. In the UK's single-payer system, more than 19% of those referred for, quote, urgent treatment for cancer wait more than two months for their first treatment. In Canada, almost eight months for brain surgery after seeing the doctor. These long waits are the defining feature of all single-payer systems, and they stand in stark contrast to U.S. health care. Waiting lists are not a feature in the United States, as stated by the OECD and verified by numerous studies. Even for low-priority checkups, U.S. wait times are far shorter than for seriously ill patients in countries with single-payer care. Single-payer systems also restrict the availability of new drugs, including cancer drugs, sometimes for years. Of the world's 54 new cancer drugs from 2013 to 2017, by 2018, 94% were available for Americans. For Brits, 70%. In Canada, 53%. In France, 43%. In Australia, 28%. These long waits have major consequences. In the medical literature, not anecdote, worse health outcomes than the U.S. system from cancer, heart disease, stroke, hypertension, diabetes. Why would Americans voluntarily move toward a system proven worse than current U.S. health care? Americans should also ask why the U.S. would move toward single-payer care when every other country with decades of that experience now use private care to solve their failures. Governments in Finland, Ireland, Italy, the U.K., the Netherlands, Norway, Spain, Sweden, Denmark, all with single-payer care spend taxpayer money now, sometimes even outside their own country on private care to solve their unconscionable failures. Americans should also wonder why those with financial means spend even more money than their already high taxes for something that is, quote, guaranteed and free. Half of all Brits earning more than 50,000 pounds now buy or plan to buy private insurance. Here's the reality. Only the poor and lower middle class are stuck with nationalized single-payer health care because only they can afford, cannot afford to circumvent the system. Those who advocate a conversion to Medicare for All fail to acknowledge this widely published evidence in the world's top medical journals, and they fail to acknowledge that continued access to care is already at risk, according to the actuary of CMS, who calculated that most hospitals, nursing facilities, and in-home health care providers already lose money per patient with Medicare. And they fail to acknowledge this, that about 70% of seniors choose to rely on private insurance supplementing or replacing traditional Medicare coverage. Why would beneficiaries need that if pure government insurance was so satisfactory? What's wrong with offering government insurance as an option? Because government insurance expansions only erode or crowd out private insurance. The public option is not a moderate or compromised proposal. It is simply a more insidious pathway to single-payer health care where only the affluent could afford to circumvent that. Contrary to the false guarantees, the only valid guarantees from single-payer health care is worse health care for Americans and higher taxes. Rather than compelling Americans to accept an inferior government-run system that literally restricts medical care to regulate costs, why not focus on creating conditions long proven to bring down prices while simultaneously improving quality in every other good or service in the United States, incentivizing uh, empowered consumers to seek value for their money with cheaper, broadly available, higher deductible care, less burdened by regulations, markedly more valuable and expanded health savings accounts, tax reforms to eliminate counterproductive incentives, and then coupling that with strategic increases by deregulation and breaking down anti-consumer barriers to competition in the supply of doctors and hospitals. These reforms would permit all Americans, rich or poor, to access the same excellence of medical care that the affluent, including some of the most strident advocates for single-payer care for the rest of us, all use for their own personal health care. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we will, um, we've concluded uh, the witnesses' uh, opening statements, and uh, we'll move to member questions. So uh, I'm going to recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Uh, now we have, uh, obviously, the whole span of um, 
of uh, what thinking on uh, a public and private um, health insurance, and um, uh, and that's been expressed uh, rather eloquently by uh, each witness. Uh, I'm taken with the following, and that is that um, the percentage of people that uh, still are not insured in our country. Uh, I, I don't understand why people that are eligible are not enrolled. It's such a loss because uh, they're subjected to uh, uh, all of the things that we know. Mr. Morley, you uh, uh, spoke to them, uh, and that they're not enrolled. That's a whole other issue, but it's 6.8 million people in our country. Uh, now, uh, in, in terms of the ACA, uh, we have... Um, uh, uh, it, we've brought the percentage of uninsured down. So, uh, we, but we need to always remember that there were 14 states where governors denied their own constituents the coverage that they were entitled to, where the federal government for five years was picking up the full tab. I'd like to hear from each one of you, and I, I, I'm sorry to say this, Dr. Atlas, but I, I think that you don't agree with anybody on the panel, but you can try to answer the question. You may, you may have something that shot. something that you like somewhere. Um, uh, but for each one of you, in terms of the thoughtful proposals that have been uh, put forward uh, by the um, uh, nine members of Congress, uh, what do you think will best help to achieve? universal health care in our country. So I'll start with uh, Ms. Rosenbaum. Thank you very much. Uh, and everyone be brief. I have three, you have three minutes to answer that, and that'll be my only question. But I'm curious to hear uh, from each one of you what fits with your thinking. Thank you. So um, if you look at the number of people in the United States who are not enrolled but who are eligible for something, the, the overwhelming majority will tell you that it's because they, they can't afford it. Uh, uh, and getting to affordable quality coverage, of course, is a very complicated thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the reality for this country over the past half century has been a, uh, an employer system that was limited in its reach to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it worked very well and it continues to work well for people uh, who are in a- But what do you think, I mean, my question is very specific. Right. Of the, of the nine uh, proposals, is there anything, given your background, research, all that you know, that you think would best help us achieve universal health care yes. in the country? I think because of the backdrop, um, there's got to be some combination uh, over, and, and it may change over time, of a strong public insurance option coupled with potentially a private insurance option for people who have good uh, comprehensive coverage. Thank Whether you. Whether you ever take the mm -hmm. next step. Thank you, but we need to uh, need to get to the others. All right, uh, and you're going to have the opportunity to tell me more in uh, uh, with written questions that it will be submitted to all the witnesses. Mr. Morley, uh, thank you uh, for asking this question. Um, I just have to say I've you know the majority of my advocacy has been defending the Affordable mm -hmm. Care Act. So thank you I, I, for I, that. You're so welcome. Mm -hmm. um, but I've had very limited opportunity to uh, to think proactively. Mm -hmm. But I take my cues from Congresswoman Schakowsky, all of them. I support all of them. Anything that's going to get us access to to uh, increase access, I I believe in all of them. You are so beautiful, Miss Ross. We already know where you are, right? But if you want to restate it. I would like to start by saying that we have always been very appreciative of, of, of the ACA. Oh, and we appreciate very what appreciate. the United Nurses uh, did in that effort, certainly. Because it moved us so much closer to making sure that everyone got mm -hmm. here. Now we need to take the next step. It won't do it anymore. Not as long as private insurers are involved. Okay. We have to eliminate barriers to care. And really, Medicare for all is the only one that will do that. Thank you. Dr. Holtzikin. Yeah, I'd say two things. Uh, first, I want to echo the, the importance of uh, genuine delivery system reforms to make 
whatever gains and coverage you achieve is sustainable because they just won't stay unless we do that. That's why I'm very worried about the Medicare for All. That's going backwards to fee-for-service medicine, which this committee with MACRA recognized was not the way to go. In terms of the low-hanging fruit, there's a report out today that there are 4.7 million people who could sign up for a uh, zero premium bronze plan today. Nothing, so it can't be cost. There's something else going on. Mm -hmm. Cover those people. Thank you very much. Yes, I mean, the, the, the disconnect in, in my view and with my proposal is that the goal is not to label someone as insured. The goal should be to bring the cost of medical care down. And when you bring the cost of medical care down, insurance premiums come down because 80% of insurance premiums are due to cost of care. And all government outlays for programs for health care are, are much less. And by that way, you broaden access to care. So the way to do that is to empower patients by putting them in the driver's seat and controlling the money to getting rid of the regulation that has falsely yeah. stopped I, I, competition. I appreciate it. And I, I, it reflects your original testimony. And um, uh, I should just announce that December 15th is the deadline for enrollment. So whomever is listening in, if it's C-SPAN and everyone else, uh, we're talking about insurance, uh, affordable coverage. Um, everyone understand December 15th. Uh, and now I would like to recognize, uh, thank you, witnesses, for uh, answering my question. Uh, now uh, it's a pleasure to recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Burgess, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you. And, and Dr. Atlas, let me just give you a, a, minute, a few minutes to wrap up what you were saying or a few seconds to wrap up what you were saying. Yes. Well, the basic plan should be to get people to be incentivized to save money on health care by higher deductibles, paying more directly, cheaper insurance, and therefore care about the cost of care to increase the supply of competitors for that uh, money and to get rid of the uh, in, in, uh, really incorrect incentives in the current tax code that make people, incentivize people to spend more on health care. That's the way everything in the United States gets reduced price with higher quality. That's exactly how it works and it can work with health care, as we have evidence that it does. Well, and I, I thank you for your observations. Thank you for your testimony. It was um, <coughs> some of the most interesting I've read in a while. Dr. Holtzi, can you talk um, somewhat about the, uh, well, I guess the phenomenon is cross-subsidization. Currently, the um, current Medicare system does not reimburse for the cost of the care. So that cost, that, that delta is covered by generally employer-sponsored insurance or individual insurance. Can you speak to that? What would happen in a world where there was no longer the ability for that cross-subsidization? I'm deeply concerned about that in these proposals. Um, a, because uh, there, there is evidence that um, many institutions have negative Medicare margins. They lose money seeing a Medicare beneficiary. Proposals that would move everyone to Medicare levels of reimbursement or, or something close to that run the risk of turning everyone into that, that position. And that risks cutting off access to care entirely, particularly if you've got a single rural hospital that can't, can't pay the bills. That's a, that's a, a, a concern to me. Uh, that, that level, the importance of that level of reimbursement uh, for things is, is brought home by some of the work the administration did on, on international drug prices, where mm -hmm. the attention was that, that drugs are cheaper elsewhere. But what was not caught in that uh, proposal was that of the 27 most expensive drugs that Medicare patients in the United States get and use, uh, only 11 were available in all the other 16 countries that were studied. If you don't reimburse at adequate levels, people do not get access to modern care. That's what I'm concerned about. Getting rid of the commercial subsidy runs that risk. And uh, of course, as you know, I spent years of my life trying to get rid of a, a Medicare formula called the Sustainable Growth Rate Formula. And Congratulations. the effect of that, of course, was to limit the number of providers who would, I mean, one of the questions I got at town halls when I first uh, became a member of Congress was, how come you turn 65 and you've got to, you've got to change your doctor? And the answer was because their doctor was not, no longer taking Medicare, was not, a, was not a, a participating physician because of the ratcheting down of reimbursement rates that happened automatically every year, year in and year out. Dr. Atlas, if you could, and you didn't mention in your, in, in your 
oral testimony, but in your written testimony, you talked um, a little bit about the, the difference in infant mortality rates in uh, the United States, other parts of the world, and, and uh, I think the statement that you have is uh, about how in the United States, the effort to save some of the most premature infants is different from other parts of the world. Some people would argue, well, maybe that's not a worthwhile activity, but I will just tell you, in 1976, I'm in medical school and a neonatal intensive care unit was unheard of, and today, every good-sized hospital has one, so our ability to take care of those infants has increased because of that. I, I just wonder if you had any thoughts on that. Yes, I do. I think this is very important vis-a-vis -vis what's been said about both life expectancy and infant mortality. These statistics are very coarse and poorly calculated numbers, and I'll give you the specific reason why infant mortality, for instance, is not a valid indicator at all, because when you look at the way it's calculated, uh, the European countries, the United States counts every live birth as a live birth with one heart rate, one heartbeat, one respiration. That's WHO criteria. When you look at countries in Western Europe, who are so-called pure nations. Some of them don't count infants as having been born unless they are a certain gestational age or unless they survive 24 to 48 hours. They don't count the babies who died as having been born if they don't live that long. So you can imagine in a fraction, if you change the denominator, mm -hmm. you have a totally invalid statistic. This is documented in the peer-reviewed medical literature. This is not my assertion. Same thing with life expectancy, although a little bit different. Most of the deaths in young people in the United States are not even due to illness. Immediate gunshot wound to the head in murder is not a reflection of healthcare quality, okay? And when you look at, uh, for instance, if lifestyle behavior is very different in the U.S. and other countries. 40% of the difference in life expectancy between the U.S. and other countries is due to one lifestyle behavior, obesity. If you standardize for these things, you see these statistics are not meaningful. That's why, to me, the best way to, to uh, yeah. sort of compare healthcare systems is to it's look at outcomes in diseases. Off, but, uh, I'm sorry, there's too many you're, facts. You're, but, uh, a lot of facts. Yeah. Just before I yield back, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to add to the record a letter from the Texas Hospital Association and the American Hospital Association. So ordered. Happy to place it in the record. Thank you. Uh, now I, the gentleman yields back. Now I, it's a pleasure to recognize the chairman of the full committee, uh, Mr. Pallone. Thank you, Ch uh, Chairwoman Eshoo. Thank you for having this hearing. I, I was one of the drafters of the ACA and obviously very proud of that fact. And I do believe that um, the ACA uh, could have and still can achieve almost universal coverage. Um, I mean, the idea was that, um, you know, 65 some percent of the people get their insurance through the employer. And then we had this large group of people who buy insurance individually on the marketplace but can't afford it. So the idea was to try to make it affordable. And that's where the subsidies came in. Um, and the mandate, you know, what, the idea with the mandate was that, you know, we'll give them enough of a subsidy so they'll buy insurance rather than paying a penalty to not buy it. But there were still two groups that were still out there, uh, even with that scenario. One were uh, those who uh, w wouldn't be able to pay a premium, and that's why we wanted to expand Medicaid. And then the last group were the uninsured. I mean, I'm sorry, not the uninsured, the undocumented, which as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, we should have addressed, and we had a debate, but we couldn't get the votes. So I wanted to ask Ms. Rosenbaum, um, you know, um, with regard to the Medicaid expansion, you know, the, the, it, was it was not supposed to be optional under the ACA, but the Supreme Court holding in M NFIB versus Sebelius said they had a choice whether to expand or not. And um, if all of the states were willing to put aside this partisanship and act in the best interest of their residents, I think we'd be much closer to the goal of universal coverage. So let me quickly, because I want to get to the undocumented. Can you tell us, as of today, how many states have expanded Medicaid? Uh, everybody but 14, a couple are still on the verge of phasing in, but there are okay. 14 left. And for those states that expanded Medicaid, you know, they got a pretty generous deal in terms of how much of that cost is paid for by the federal government, correct? Yes. And Congressman Vesey's bill that we're, re we're considering today, the Incentivizing Medicaid Expansion Act, would make that offer even more generous, correct? Yes. Um, so if all states were to expand Medicaid as originally intended by the ACA, 
How many people do you think would gain coverage that don't uh, have it, it now? It's, we're at about uh, 15 million now. It's roughly another 2 million people, a little more than 2 million people. Okay. Now, do you want to, uh, uh, not open-ended because I want to get to the undocumented, but would you give me any sense of why you think these states are still rejecting the Medicaid expansion? Is it strictly ideology? What is it, you think? Th this has been looked at a lot. Um, I would say it's a deep philosophical opposition to the expansion. Uh, cost certainly doesn't explain it. The federal financing doesn't explain it, even at, even at the current rate. So I would say we're dealing with something deeper. Ideological. All right. Now, let me get to the undocumented. Um, you know, we, we know that a large portion of this country's uninsured rate comes from undocumented individuals. What would you, like, if we covered all the undocumented, what, you know, what do you think percentage-wise that would mean? Well, I mean, that, that would be universal coverage. There are proposals that are, are universal uh, uh, up to legally present uh, uh, immigrants um, uh, that, and also that address the short term, the people who have been here for less than five years. Well, let me put it this but way. Let's assume that everybody who was yes. legally here, documented, had insurance coverage. I think we'd would be accurate to say we'd still maybe be only at 95% because there'd be another 5% that are undocumented. I mean, I know that's a huge right. No, and and it's not it's not a good thing for any healthcare system to leave anybody out. And okay, but would you agree? You know, even if everyone was covered who was legal, you'd probably still have another 5% of the total population that's not covered because yes. they're undocumented. Yes. Okay, so. Um, I mean, I agree with you. It doesn't make any sense. You get sick, you spread disease. I mean, what are we talking about here? It's, you know, it's, it's not, you can't operate in isolation. So, um, I mean, those undocumented people obviously have health care needs. How do they get that care? And what cost does that add to our system? How is this, does this make any sense? I don't think so, to not cover the undocumented in terms of the cost to our system and how we operate. Um, those who are willing to come forward use isolated public health services. Uh, in, in extreme situations, they would turn to an emergency department, uh, but the care is uneven, too late, uh, uh, and too many people live in the shadows really without any health care at all. There, there are no waiting lists for people who are uninsured. But also, doesn't it just not make sense from a cost point of view? Because if those people got preventative care and were able to see a doctor, they wouldn't end up in the hospital emergency room because they wouldn't get as sick. I mean, you want to comment on that? A absolutely, um, uh, and it's you know, very difficult to uh, begin to quantify these kinds of shifts, but very important to bring everybody in to deal with health problems before they become serious enough to be high cost. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the gentleman yields back. It's a pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chairman, sure. and I appreciate um, the hearing. And I appreciate the people in the healthcare sector because it's compassionate trying to do the right thing. Even those who are trying to make sure we can pay for it adequately, we're, we're on it for the, for the right reasons. You know, I was here when we passed Medicare Part D, it's helpful. I was here when we did expansion of Medicare Advantage, very <coughs> helpful. Um, so, and, but numbers and budgets and dollars matter. So Dr. Holst Eakin, what happens with the hospital insurance HI trust fund uh, in 2026? At, at that point, it will be exhausted. And the what does that mean, exhausted? Um, it means that the payments out to hospitals will have cumulatively exceeded the payroll taxes going in. And at that point, there will not be the legal authority to reimburse for care. Can you say that again? Uh, at that point, it will be illegal for you to reimburse hospitals for their care to Medicare beneficiaries. They'll have to do it. So how do, by adding more people to Medicare, how does it help solve this 2026 funding problem? Uh, it would not help solve. That would increase the outflow without raising the inflow. So it actually would prop create a insolvency much sooner. Yes. And Dr. Atlas, you identify this in your testimony, kind of, you know, on your figure three here in your statement. And it, this is no different than our problems with Social Security. Uh, workers today pay for Medicare for our retirees. Uh, the more people are retiring and living longer. It's financially unsustainable. Is that what you're trying to say here on this figure three? 
Yeah, what, what figure uh, you're alluding to shows that the number of workers funding per Medicare beneficiary started out when the program started at 4.6, and now it's about 2 point something. And so when you have not enough people working to fund the program, at the same time as this explosion of an aging population and actually a positive of people living longer, living longer also means incurring more medical expenditures because older people... Well, let me reclaim my time, and I appreciate that. So I, I want our, our friends here to understand that there is a funding crisis. I mean, I've said it for 20 years. <laughs> Someday someone's going to believe us uh, that there is a funding problem on Social Security, there's a funding problem with Medicare. Um, and we, we are part of the problem in Medicare because who in this room, who doesn't get visited by people saying the coding for fee for service is screwed up, pay us more, right? Who doesn't get visited by uh, folks here in the audience who say we're not compensated enough, right? And, that, and that's going to continue. Um, let me ask a question to both you, Dr. Hotsikin and Dr. Atlas. What happens when a new product comes to market under Medicare for All? Uh, it's not clear. Okay. And we're talking about this, too. We have this big yeah. HR3 drug debate yeah. uh, about, well, maybe 10 new drug blockbuster drugs won't get to the market. Some es estimates are 100. Uh, if you're the, the patient who's looking for that life-saving new drug, you want to be able to get it. And it, and it is. I think the, the countries that we've talked about who have single-payer systems, their, their actuary on their, not actuary, but their listing takes a long time for new products to come on the market. Is that correct? That, that's absolutely correct. In the U.S., of new brain name drugs, new, new therapies have become available. 95% uh, are available in three or four months. That, that number is about half that size elsewhere. Right. And Medicare Advantage under Medicare for All, what happens to that? It's gone. It's gone. Let me finish with this. Um, in my, I'm from rural America. Um, a lot of our hospitals are not-for-profit, uh, faith-based institutions um, and uh, who, who do their best to cover folks. Uh, Madam uh, Chairman, I'd like to submit two letters from the record from uh, the National Right to Life Committee, April 29, 20, 2019, and the March for Life Action. And um, whenever you're willing to do that, and I know you, want, you may want to look at it, but I want to read a statement. There are certain key details of this legislation that would mean dramatic and radical departure from longstanding abortion-related policy. The legislation would require government funding of abortion without limitation and also likely would require unwilling hospitals and doctors to perform abortion procedures. Um, when you go into a government system and you don't have choice, you have to play by the rules. And uh, Madam Speaker, I'd like to submit those two. And I yield I'll back my time. I'll them and uh, advise the gentleman as to whether they'll be placed in Thank the you. record. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's a pleasure to, uh, the gentleman yields back. It's a pleasure to recognize uh, our colleague, uh, Mr. Engel from New York, for his five minutes of question. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I have a lot to get in. I'm going to see if I can do it all. But. Um, let me first say health care continues to eat a growing share of every American family's income. We know that from, from year, years of watching this and also from the testimony today. The trend is reflected by the health care sector consuming an increasing portion of our nation's GDP. In 2016, it's accounted for 18 percent of our GDP, but in 2026, it will jump to 20 percent, and that trend is unaffordable and unsustainable. And every day, like my colleagues, I hear heartbreaking stories from my constituents about how families are having to choose between paying for life-saving health care and other necessities such as groceries. So I am pleased to be an original co-sponsor of the Medicare for All Act and a founding member of the Medicare for All Caucus. This legislation will improve and expand Medicare for all Americans and will prov provide new benefits, including dental, vision and hearing, all without co-pays, premiums, and deductibles. As I've said many times before, health care is a human right, and I believe that H.R. 1384 will help every American access high-quality health care. Uh, Ms. Ross, let me ask you, could you please describe how Medicare for All will save money and put our nation's health care expenditures on a sustainable financial footing? 
I think the biggest savings in Medicare for all will come from um, administrative costs because right now there are so many different plans to administer. Nurses and doctors just want to care for their patients. That's their main goal. So without the interference of, the interference of those insurance companies, we can actually do that. So you've got the, the lowering of the administrative costs. You've got accurate budgeting, which we've not had before that's actually sustainable. Thank you. Um, Madam Chairwoman, I, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit into the record a letter in support of H.R. 1384 from 253 leading economists discussing how this bill will reduce health care costs while guaranteeing every American access to comprehensive care. So ordered. Thank you. Uh, let me also say, uh, again, uh, uh, Madam Chair, I want to thank you and Mr. Pallone for holding today's important hearing. Uh, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, which I helped author, I was on this committee when we tried so hard first to get a, uh, a everyone uh, covered and then uh, for a public option, we, we, we didn't have the votes. Um, but the ACA has enabled over 20 million Americans to become covered, including 100,000 of my constituents. And yet despite this remarkable progress, the Trump administration has taken actions to gut the ACA, including promoting junk plans and curtailing outreach programs. This committee has led the charge to reverse this sabotage th through legislation such as the Strengthening Health Care and Lowering Prescription Drug uh, Costs Act. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Chairwoman Eshu for, for her hard work with that. Uh, with that said, we must continue to build on the ACA success. And two of the bills before us today, introduced by New York, my colleagues in New York, uh, Brian Higgins and Antonio Delgado, would create public options to help improve access to coverage. Let me ask Ms. Rosenbaum, how would a public option as envisioned by the bills drafted by Congressman Higgins and Delgado help strengthen the ACA marketplaces? Uh, what they would do is, is introduce a competitive alternative to private plans uh, uh, for especially vulnerable older Americans whose health care costs are quite expensive. Uh, relatively speaking, this would give them a more affordable way to buy care. Thank you. And, and finally, Mr. Morley, I have a question for you because I want to thank you for coming from my hometown, New York City, uh, to testify. Uh, one of the hallmark features of the ACA is that it prohibits health insurance companies from discriminating against Americans living with pre-existing conditions such as diabetes. The Center for American Progress estimates that nearly 311,000 of my constituents below the age of 65 have a pre-existing condition, and the Trump administration's efforts to weaken these protections through regulatory actions jeopardize the health coverage of my constituents. So I want to thank uh, the leadership of members like Congresswoman Custer, who authored the Protecting Americans with Pre-Existing Conditions. The House is fighting back against these policies. So Mr. Morley, could you describe the impact that eliminating the ACA's protections for pre-existing conditions would have on your ability to access health care services? It wouldn't just obviously be mine. It would be for 130 million Americans. So I can't really speak for myself on that. I think the stress of uh, all the sabotage that's been done by the uh, Trump administration has been uh, really inc overwhelming at times. I've lost a lot of sleep, as I'm sure a lot of a lot of people have. That's that's the number one concern I, I, I hear from people. But uh, limiting my my access to to care, uh, the insurance companies can go back to discriminated excuse me discriminating against me. And, and as I stated in my in my oral testimony. Uh, you know, I've experienced that already, and it's cost me tens of thousands of dollars, and I had the ability to work at, the, at that point in my life, and I don't have the ability to work anymore, so there's no way that I could pay for that. I have uh, monthly infusions. Each one of my infusions for uh, uh, my lupus cost $10,000, and there's no way I could pay for that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the gentleman yields back. I, I just want to add something uh, to uh, uh, what uh, the gentleman from New York said uh, relative to the ACA and the public option. 
The House passed that. It was the Senate that fell short on, uh, we all feel very strongly about it because we fought so hard and uh, uh, we achieved what we wanted to achieve in the House, but I think it's important to have that as part of the record. It's a pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Long, for his uh, five minutes of questions. It's a pleasure to be recognized by my buddy, the uh, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you. Uh, and thank you all for being here today on this extremely important topic. Uh, every day where we hear of someone, uh, in fact, when I go home, I usually give them the health report, and uh, it, it, there's a, seems like every day someone's coming down with a disease, someone we know, someone we're close to, near and dear to. My uh, daughter, she's 30 now, 25 years old. She uh, was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. She went through all of the treatments and uh, lost her hair, got her hair back, and uh, is doing very, very good now. In fact, I'm going to get married next October. And uh, I'm wearing today my St. Jude Children's Research Center tie that I'm very passionate about, have been for over, well, close to 40 years now, I guess, but over 30 years. <clears throat> when I was an auctioneer before this life for 30 years. I was on the National Auctioneers Board of Directors, and we picked one national charity to support, and that was St. Jude. So I always try and showcase my St. Jude tie at any uh, opportunity. Sunday night, we were at the Kennedy Center Honors. Two of the honorees, one uh, that founded Earth, Wind, and Fire, suffered from Parkinson's disease before uh, his demise, and Linda Ronstadt, who had to give up. Uh, singing one of the most beautiful voices ever uh, was honored Sunday and she had to give it up due to Parkinson's disease so again it's a very very important topic and thank you all for being here uh, Dr. Atlas first name Charles middle name Charles any not many people know who that was anymore I don't think <laughs> I'm showing my age but I've never met an Atlas that wasn't named Charles so I'm just uh, okay. uh, curious but uh, inquiring minds want to know but uh, if you think back to 2013 with the rollout of uh, healthcare.gov and all the issues that they had getting the website opening up and uh, I think six people actually were able to sign up that first day. It took months and months to get it uh, where it was fully functional and more than a one and a half billion dollars over budget to get it up and going. In the end, healthcare.gov website finally launched about three and a half years after the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Medicare for All bills estimated to cost over $30 trillion and would uh, fully transition from our current health care system to a single payer system in two years. So if the United States government couldn't build a functioning website in three and a half years and went massively over budget trying, uh, how can we possibly expect the government to successfully transition to a single payer system in just two years and stay on budget? Any comment? Yeah, I don't think there's an answer to the question, except I would say to uh, the point about why single payer, why Medicare for all will save money. It's because the same reason that every other single payer system is less than the United States. They restrict the use of health care and they have worse results for that. So if that's what people, voters are interested in doing, having worse health care and having more people die, like Canada and England and everywhere else, and no access to these drugs that we enjoy as Americans, uh, you know, that, that would be a reform that would be appropriate. I think the best way to get access is to reduce the cost for everyone, just like it's done. That's why the cell phone in your pocket, it's a supercomputer, doesn't cost $20,000. From competition and empowering consumers who care about the price of what they're actually directly buying. Okay. The uh, Harvard School of Business uh, determined that the lack of relevant experience, lack of leadership, and time constraints were the primary factors leading to healthcare.gov's initial failure. Do you believe the United States government currently has the manpower, resources, management talent, and expertise to fundamentally take over our healthcare system? Not in the government, no. The private sector would. Okay. In your uh, testimony, the opposition to single payer should not, you said the, the opposition to single payer should not focus only on requirement of for massive new taxes, but instead on the well documented half century of its failure to provide timely quality medical care. This failure is not just about low priority checkups or routine appointments, it's about people that are seriously ill. 
Uh, you note that the UK's uh, NHS system has set a standard and declared it would be acceptable for 15% of cancer patients, and I've spoken of cancer patients, including my daughter here this morning, to wait two full months. And when I think of the day that I took her to the emergency room here in Washington, and uh, first was told her there was nothing wrong and go home, but they had an IV in her arm and she couldn't get dressed and go home, they decided to do an x-ray and they came back and they said, you have a large mass in your chest and it's malignant. Uh, waiting two full, two full months for treatment would definitely not been acceptable in her <coughs> case or it should not be in anyone's case. And uh, one out of five patients has to wait over two months for their first treatment of cancer. And I'm beyond my time by 20 seconds and I uh, yield back to my friend. Gentleman yields back. I'm a kind chairwoman. I have a hard time cutting people off. It's only at the urging of others that I do this. <laughs> so That's it's an a uh, gavel, that, yeah. He is a, a real live auctioneer. You can, you can hear it in his voice, <laughs> can't you? Uh, now all the uh, let's see, we have all of our women uh, to uh, ask questions. <laughs> Uh, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Matsui, is recognized for five minutes for her questions. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the witnesses for all being here today, and, and thank uh, Chairwoman Eshu for having this hearing here today. You know, for the past decade, our health care system has been constantly under attack. Republicans in Congress and the state houses across the country have made it their mission to repeal or systematically undermine the Affordable Care Act. The goal of universal coverage has long been, as we always say, a North Star for the Democratic Party. We believe everyone should have access to care, and I was disappointed when more progressive policies to expand coverage were ultimately left out of the Affordable Care Act. But that's why this moment presents a unique opportunity. The ACA improved the quality of basic care everyone receives. It unlocked access to care for Americans who have been historically shut out of or priced out of the system. It has expanded coverage to over 20 million Americans since it was signed into law. While acknowledging our successes, we must also recognize the need for improvement, the need to look up again at the North Star of universal coverage and ask ourselves, what comes next? It is my hope that today we can have a productive conversation about how to obtain universal coverage, increase the role of federal government in lowering the cost of care, and maintain our role as the global leader in cutting edge treatments and health technology. Our path forward will say a lot about who we are as a nation. Healthcare touches all of our lives in some way. That's why I'm excited by the proposals before us today, all of which are united by the common goal of improving the access and affordability of healthcare. California is the first state in the nation to improve coverage affordability for low and middle income consumers by expanding subsidies available through our ACA marketplace, Covered California. California has also reinstated the individual mandate tax penalty. As a result of both policies, plans sold through our health insurance marketplace saw a record low statewide average rate change of less than 1% for 2020, bringing savings and stability to an entire individual market. Many of the bills we're discussing today would enhance ACA premium tax credits and cost-sharing subsidies to marketplace enrollees. Ms. Rosenbaum, can you briefly explain how the ACA subsidy cliff works and what groups face the biggest affordability challenges as a result of this phenomena? Yes. Um, there are two kinds of subsidies under the ACA. There's a premium subsidy and then there's a cost-sharing subsidy. Mm -hmm. The premium subsidy begins uh, at the federal poverty level uh, and it ends at 400% of poverty uh, and it essentially works by keeping down your cost of, of coverage to a certain percentage of your income. Uh, currently, um, uh, the, the subsidy uh, has sort of a steep cliff and it ends completely at 400% at, at of poverty. The cost sharing assistance um, is similar in that it essentially discounts the cost of care at the point of service, uh, but its cliff is steeper and it ends at 250% of poverty. Right. 
So you'd agree that improving subsidies is key to increasing coverage for both low and middle income individuals. Absolutely, it's the number one reason why people. Are so, there. if we were to scale these solutions national nationwide, how would you expect enhanced subsidies coupled with the return of the individual mandate to impact overall uninsured rates and the stability of the individual marketplace? Um, estimates suggest that just those two changes alone. Uh, probably along with, of course, something for the Medicaid expansion states that have not expanded, uh, would probably raise the insured levels by at least 10 million people, right. uh, even more with auto enrollment. Sure. Now, in the Medicaid expansion states, the ACA is working as we envisioned, filling in historical coverage gaps tied to income level by expanding Medicaid eligibility and providing subsidies for pur purchasing coverage. In non-expansion states, many adults whose incomes are above Medicaid eligibility but below the threshold for subsidies are trapped in a coverage gap. Ms. Rosenbaum, how many uninsured people nationwide will be eligible for Medicaid if their states expanded? It's slightly more than 2 million people. So are larger populations of people caught in the coverage gap concentrated in certain states or parts of the country? Yes. Uh, they are disproportionately people of color. They are disproportionately residents of southern states. Mr. Morley, I just want to make a comment. Thank you for your testimony. We really do understand what you have been going through, and we really want to work on behalf of you and many other patients such as yourself. And thank you for sharing your unique perspective with us. I'm uh, equally concerned about the actions taken by the administration to undermine Medicaid and ACA protections. And and that have increasingly exposed, you know, consumers to coverage acts. And believe me, that is what we're trying to do today, to ensure that we level the playing field and understand how important it is. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for saying that. I appreciate that. Gentlewoman yields back. Uh, it's a pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Guthrie, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was, uh, there's another hearing of this full committee, a subcommittee that was meeting earlier, and was there on foreign drug inspection, so I've been able to hear your stories, Mr. Morley, but uh, God bless you, and, and thanks for being here to share. Um, what I, what I kind of like to talk about with Dr. Atlas and Dr. Holsaken is um, I think all of us are here wanting people to be covered with the, the question is that we get to when you look at Medicare for All, how does it change the health care system we have today? We're, we're currently in discussion this week about H.R. 3, which is setting a price for, for pharmaceuticals. We all want lower drug prices, and there's a bar bipartisan bill to do that, but now we're going to where we're setting drug prices to the point where CBO says we will get less, eight to 15 less cures over the next 10 years. And people on this committee in that hearing said, if we're gonna lose uh, miracle cures, or they didn't say that, I'll put the words, if we're gonna lose some cures because we're gonna have lower drug prices, that's, that's a trade-off we're willing to pay. I like to take people when they come to my district to uh, Owensboro, a fantastic medical center, Bowling Green, two medical hospitals, uh, Elizabethtown Medical Hospital, Danville, Ephraim McDowell, father of modern gynecology hospital. And, and just say, if we were in a European or, or state or Canada, we, a city this size would not have a hospital this, of this quality, in my opinion. I mean, and I tell them, take me to a city of uh, less than 100,000 people that have world-class, you can do heart surgery. We do a lot of different things. So the concern as we go down this path is, and we have to, it's not just a slogan that we can put on a bumper sticker or a t-shirt, it, it's how is this going to affect the healthcare system that Americans have. We can cure sickle cell anemia, we, uh, cystic fibrosis is going to be a, a, a disease that people can live with for that, it's going to be a maintenance disease, artificial pancreas is available now, just the things that are coming out of this country and we are subsidizing the rest of the world and that is an issue that we try to address in HR 19 on drugs is that we have a U.S. trade negotiator negotiate with other drugs. But just ramping down payments and giving in order to get 100% universal coverage in one plan, Medicare for all, at the expense of that, which I, I don't see how you take that much money out of the system and not lose hospitals. For example, under the Affordable Care Act, we did Medicaid expansion and within, in my state, expanded, uh, Kentucky, and with Medicaid expansion, uh, it was paid for by decreasing the dish payments, disproportionate share payments, because if everybody's covered, we're not gonna have to have these subsidies. Well, I will tell you, every rural hospital in Kentucky today, an expanded state would say, if you, and we're making it up, we're, gonna, we're doing Medicaid expansion and dish payments because it just doesn't work, they would all say they would close or have difficult, particularly the smaller ones, I won't say Owensboro or Bowling Green, but smaller hospitals would close 
They told me if we didn't make up the dish payments when the policy was everybody be covered, but the problem is the payments are so low, even the people covered, the hospitals can't make it up. So uh, Dr. Atlas or Hosekin, or I'll open up to anybody, what, what do you see if we go to one size reimbursements for Medicaid, Medicaid to all of our hospitals and our providers, what kind of healthcare system would you see? For instance, we know under HR3 that 50% of the drugs that would be priced under HR3 are not available in Canada. They're not. They're just not available. That, that's just a fact. And, and so what would you see with our system? Well, I can, I'll answer about the drug pricing issue that hasn't been brought up. When you look at what a single-payer system does with drug pricing, we can look at the NHS. They have a budget impact test of 2017. They set a number, and if the system is going to cost 20 million pounds or more for a drug, they're not going to have that drug available, and they're going to, quote, negotiate, and they give themselves three years. If your wife has breast cancer and wants one of these new drugs, she's going to sit there for three years while the government, the NHS, negotiates that price down. It's been calculated by the NHS itself and the Alzheimer's Foundation in, in the UK that a drug for Alzheimer's would have to cost less than $4 a month to be approved because so many people need it. So if you look at it this way, ironically, the more people that need the drug when you're capping the total expenditure, the more people that need the drug, the less likely it will be available. That's what the NHS budget impact test does. You can't have the government, a third party, the government doesn't care uh, if your wife doesn't get her drug, she cares if she doesn't. Well, this is what I want to point out is that we can't just sell that we're creating a whole new payment system and not affect the healthcare system we have. That is, I think people are visioning we're going to have exactly what we have and somebody else is paying for it, and that's not what will happen, in my opinion. Well, we know that the CMS actuary just now said it, that they're warning in 2018 hospitals and nursing facilities and in-home care are going out of business because they're losing money per patient. If you lose money per patient, you don't make up for that in volume, as the old joke goes. Dr. Hose yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> that, that restricts access to existing technologies, and in the data we see that increasing quality, which is the adoption of a medical innovation, is correlated with higher reimbursements. You, you put all that at risk, and the international evidence shows it. Our domestic evidence shows it as well. Thank you very much. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, I have a factoid, and that is uh, a lot of people have said things about the Affordable Care Act. Uh, all members of Congress receive their health care through the Affordable Care Act. All staffers receive their health care through the Affordable Care Act. I think there's only one member that has not accepted it, uh, and that's uh, Dr. Burgess, but that was his choice. So, um, I think that uh, we have a lot of people and invested in it. And I just can't help but say, thank God for Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, where would people in this country be without that coverage? So it's a pleasure to recognize the uh, gentlewoman from Florida, uh, Ms. Castor, for her five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairwoman Eshoo, and let me thank you for this hearing, because isn't it refreshing that we can focus on how we are going to lower the cost of health care in America, expand access, build upon uh, Medicare and Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act, so thank you very much. Dr. Rosenbaum, uh, in your testimony, you cite the lasting and measurable achievements under uh, the Affordable Care Act. And Peter Morley, thank you for, for being here and speaking on behalf of millions of Americans with pre-existing conditions. When you say the Affordable Care Act, here we are 10 years later, it's a time to take stock. What stands out to you overall, Dr. Rosemont? I think uh, the, the remarkable effect of the affordability provisions, uh, the enormous impact of the market reforms for people like Peter Morley, uh, and, and the uh, vision of combining access to affordable coverage with actually improvements in communities to access the care. So the protection, no longer can a, a, an American be discriminated against for any pre-existing condition. Correct. 
it's been very meaningful for young people to stay on their parents' policies until they're right. age 26. And to Mr. Shimkus, who was here, remember the Affordable Care Act extended the life of the Medicare Trust Fund, and it strengthened Medicare, and it helped close the donut hole. Now the Democrats this week are going to pass uh, one of the missing links to allow Medicare to negotiate prices and drive down drug costs and then carry that over to private insurance. So that's going to be uh, a great thing for families. Uh, you know, coming from the state of Florida, boy, there's some good news and there's some really difficult news. We've led in the mar marketplace uh, every year. We have about 1.8 million Floridians who sign up for affordable coverage under healthcare.gov. At the same time, we have a little less than a, a million of our residents who are stuck in the coverage gap. That means they're too poor to access the tax credits. This is crazy, okay, Floridians? And this goes for Texas, too. We want to bring our tax dollars home. And Levitt Partners did a study recently, came out, $13.8 billion of your tax dollars, they want to give them back to the state of Florida so that about a million of our residents can get uh, signed up for Medicaid health services. Chairwoman Eshoo, when you talk about this, this uh, cohort of people who don't have health coverage, because of that Florida, the, in fact, they haven't ex expanded Medicaid, 10% of all working adult, or all uninsured adult population comes because of that coverage gap. So I appreciated Chairman Pallone and, and Congresswoman Matt Sui highlighting this. Dr. Rosenbaum, can we just, we can look at uh, Mr. Vesey's uh, legislation to increase the incentives, but I mean, $13.8 billion, a, we'd cover people, we would, it would help our GDP, we'd be able to hire, uh, we'd be healthier, infant mortality, I mean, across the board. What else can we do? We have to just go ahead and say, we intended Medicaid to be expanded under the Affordable Care Act. Do we have to craft that again and pass it? And would it withstand scrutiny at the Supreme Court? Uh, well, certainly, um, uh, further incentivizing states to expand coverage is a, is a good idea. Uh, why a state would not expand coverage is a bit of a mystery. Um, especially since the expansion would not only extend coverage to all the people who are left out, but it would actually bring down the cost of premiums in the marketplace because in states that start their marketplace coverage at 138% of poverty, the premiums tend to be lower. Uh, so it's good. Can we just pass the law, go back and... Unfortunately, the Supreme, well, the Supreme Court has said that um, uh, expansion on a mandatory basis is no longer constitutional. But certainly, many people have thought, I'm among them, that sweetening the pot is a very good thing to do in mm -hmm. hopes that the expansion will happen. So, uh, Peter Morley, thank you for, uh, for providing a real-world example of what, how meaningful it is to have health care coverage. You know, we're in the holiday season now, and is there any better uh, gift to a loved one than health insurance? And tell it, remind us what the what the deadline is. First of all, thank you for uh, saying that. I spent three days in Congress last week, in the House and the Senate, making videos with uh, with uh, people like uh, Congresswoman Cast Castor. Uh, the deadline for the federal exchange deadline is December fifteenth. Wow, that's Sunday. I it's think. Sunday. Yeah. Go to healthcare.gov. Uh, that's the way that, that uh, we keep enhancing the ACA. And just to add, on when you talk about Medicaid expansion, a lot of people, I've heard for majority of people in Texas and Florida, those are two major states that have not expanded Medicaid. And I am very sympathetic and compassionate to that. So thank you for mentioning that. Thank you. I made the announcement, December 15th, whomever is tuned in. Uh, it's a pleasure to recognize uh, the gentlewoman from Delaware, Ms. Blunt uh, Rochester, for her five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And I, I want to thank both panels for your testimony and the deliberations. 
Um, as I was sitting here listening to the testimony, I thought of a quote from Martin Luther King that says, of all the forms of inequity, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. A decade ago, this very subcommittee debated one of the country's most sweeping and comprehensive pieces of healthcare policy, the Affordable Care Act. 20 million Americans gained health coverage through either the marketplace or Medicaid expansion. And for the first time, patients received critical protections from things like coverage denials because of a pre-existing condition like you shared, Mr. Morley or lifetime limits on essential health benefits. Delaware alone saw the state's uninsured rate drop to 5%. But an issue that's still plaguing our healthcare system is cost. I held town hall meetings, I met with families, I met with small businesses in my state, and three things kept coming up. For many, the out-of-pocket costs were unaffordable. For some, there were gaps in coverage or they were under, underinsured. And number three, health inequities and disparities still persist, which is why we're still talking about maternal mortality in this country. Since hearing those concerns, I've been working on a comprehensive strategy, the Cap Costs Now Act. I'm gonna say it again, the Cap Costs Now Act. My bill would cap out-of-pocket costs, including premiums, deductibles, and co-pays, so no one is spending their whole paycheck for health care, no matter where they are getting their health insurance. The Cap Cost Now Act would allow us to achieve truly universal coverage by automatically covering everyone through an easy to navigate system with new options for coverage, such as a Medicare E program for those 50 to 64. Finally, the bill would align incentives in our health care system to better tackle health inequity and continue our nation's move towards value-based care. Unaffordable out-of-pocket health care costs aren't just an issue in my state. The Commonwealth Fund has found that about one in six Americans face health care costs they can't afford, even with health insurance. Deductibles alone have tripled in the last decade. More than four in 10 workers enrolled in a high deductible plan reported that they don't have enough savings to cover their deductible. In other words, in the words of one of our previous witnesses, if you can't afford it, you don't have it. So I'd like to thank my colleagues for their leadership who were on the first panel and their work on the various pieces of legislation. And I'd like to thank all of you who are on this panel. We all want our constituents to have quality health care. And we all want our constituents to be able to afford it. With my plan, we can move towards affordable, universal coverage without starting from scratch or removing the 180 million Americans in employer-sponsored insurance from their existing plans. We can immediately get to the work by building on the current foundation of our nation's healthcare system to provide everyone with coverage that is affordable and universal. As I begin to roll out my health care proposal in the upcoming weeks, I want to encourage my colleagues to look out for it and to support the Cap Cost Now Act. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentlewoman, what, excuse me, the gentlewoman yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Carter, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank all of you for being here. I appreciate this very much, uh, you taking time out. This is um, extremely important, extremely important to the future of our country, to the future of health care in our country in particular. I find it interesting that we're having this discussion during the same week that we're also going to be voting on Speaker Pelosi's bill, H.R. 3, that is going to, to essentially keep up to 100 life-saving drugs from coming to the market if it, it were to be enacted, and that comes from the, um, from the Economic D um, Development Commission, and that's what they have proposed. Even CBO tells us that we can expect anywhere from 8 to 15 drugs not to come to market if this were to be passed. But Dr. Atlas, I wanted to ask you, because I think your testimony really tells the full story, if it, um, this, it's come up in our debates about 
the uh, anti-cures bill, H.R. 3, as you mentioned in your testimony as well, that other single-payer systems have far fewer choices in terms of medicines available to them. Is that correct? That's absolutely true. And since most new drugs are cancer drugs, people die because of that. You, you cited some figures. I, I listened attentively to, um, to your opening statement about other countries and comparing us to what is available here in America as opposed to what's available in those other countries. Do you have that by, by chance again? Yes, I do, because I was speaking so quickly that probably no one remembers what I said. I'd like to make sure they do remember what you said, because yeah. I certainly heard it. The latest data on the 54 new cancer drugs launched from 2013 to 17 in the world. Within two years, the United States patients had 94% available, Brits had 70%, Canada's cancer patients had 53% of those drugs, France 43%, Australia 28%. It's proven in economics, but not and in drugs in particular. When you cap prices, you're going to stop the production, the availability of good, and the innovation of that good. The real solution to drug prices is to figure out why they're costing so much, because the cost of developing a drug has exploded over the past decade to $2.5 billion in 15 years. And nobody is going to develop a drug if they're not going to get that money back. So we, as a, as a government, really, have added a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of hurdles to the, and therefore costs to the development of new drugs, and that's where the attention should be focused. And, you, you know, for those of you who, who don't know, and I'm, I'm sure members of the committee know, currently I'm the only pharmacist serving in Congress. I spent my professional career dealing with this. I've seen nothing short We're of miracles. We're so glad that you <laughs> said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who knew? That's right. <laughs> Excuse them. But anyway, <laughs> I, I have seen nothing short of miracles it, it, through the way of research and development and what has come on the market. I give the example all the time of the drug uh, Savaldi. Uh, here's a drug that when I first started practicing pharmacy in 1980, if you were diagnosed with hepatitis C, you were going to die. I mean, that's all there was to it. Now, how phenomenal is it that we can cure that disease with a pill? That is simply phenomenal to me. Someone who, who, who was there at that time, who saw people who came in who were diagnosed with that disease and, and, and knew that it, they, were, they were diagnosed that they were going to be dying soon. But now we can treat them. That is phenomenal. Now, you know, the thing that concerns me so much is that both sides, both Democrats and Republicans, want the same thing. I get it. I understand that if a drug costs $85,000 is not accessible to you, it does you no good whatsoever. I get the fact that we need to bring prescription drug prices down. I also understand that there are other things that we can do aside from, from what is being proposed in H.R. 3 that will lower drug prices without stifling innovation. And that's what I'm trying to get to here. And let me ask you, Dr. Atlas, why would these countries restrict their patients' access to these medications? Is it, is it simply just to manage the cost of government? That's exactly. Well, they're trying, to, they're trying to minimize the cost that they're paying out for their health care system. And the way that they all do it is to restrict the use of care, the availability of technology, the availability of drugs, and their results of their survivals in these specific diseases are worse than ours. Exactly. And, and, and again, I, I don't fault my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. They want the same thing I want. We all want the same thing, to bring the prescription prices down. And we can do that. And, and, and I see the need for transparency so much because I know what's going on here. And I know that there are, are middlemen who are, who are bringing no value whatsoever to the system but are taking profits out of the system. And Thank you again, Dr. Atlas, for being here and for bringing up this important point. Thank all of you for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, it's a pleasure <coughs> to recognize um, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Kennedy, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank my colleagues for, uh, I think, um, 
unanimously at this point, all agreeing how important this hearing is. Grateful to, uh, to be here for it. I want to thank our witnesses uh, for your courage, for your testimony, for your service, uh, and for your perspective. Um, it is important that we get this right. Let's start by um, just walking through some of the comments that I think some of our colleagues have made and, and has been uh, put forward in testimony. This question that some aspect of a, a more robust um, guarantee of access to coverage is somehow going to uh, make sure that drugs are not available. Uh, Ms. Ross, are you familiar with the statistic that roughly 26% of patients in need of insulin ration their care? I am. And so does that seem like Insulin is, in fact, readily available in the United States of America? It does not. Are, when we talk about the fact that procedures might end up in expanded wait times, um, are you aware that for GoFundMe, that popular crowdsource fundraising website, that a third, a third of the donations off a GoFundMe page are used for health care costs? Are you aware of that? I am aware of that. Are you aware that the founder of GoFundMe said that, uh, quote, I'll get this more or less right, that he did not, they did not intend to found a site that would be one of the most influential healthcare companies, but it turns out that they did. As a I did page. hear that, yes. We talked about wait times and access to care. Are you aware, Ms. Ross, that 55% of the counties in our country do not have a single practicing psychiatrist, psychologist, or social worker? I am aware. Are you aware of the fact that about fi over 50% of the adults in this country in need of mental behavioral illness will not get the access that they care today? Yes. Are you aware of the fact that that's actually worse for kids? Absolutely. So I was at a regional hospital in my district a little while ago, keep in mind, in a state with 98%, 98% of people covered with health insurance, 98. There was a little boy that was waiting, that was being boarded. He'd been waiting for over 150 hours and counting, waiting for a bed. That they couldn't get the, <clears throat> the stretchers down the hallways in the emergency room because there's so many patients suffering mental illness waiting for a bed. That a mom had come in uh, to my office now a couple years ago detailing her daughter's challenges with mental behavioral illness and at one point they, their daughter was boarded on the, on the neurology floor at a academic medical center in Boston for 19 days as they called looking for a bed from Virginia to Maine. 19 days. Any guess as to how much it would cost to board a child at a neurology floor waiting for a bed in Boston? A lot. That sounds about right to me. <laughs> Mr. Holzik and I think would agree with the a lot figure. <laughs> Fair enough. That's a good estimate. So uh, I, I point these stories and these statistics out because I think the reality that I think many of us experience in our healthcare system today is that when we talk about quality, when we talk about access, when we talk about what treatments are available, without question, without question, they're right, without question, from a perspective, Dr. Atlas, what you just said is correct. The, the challenge that, where I would challenge you and challenge others on this is that the focus of that system ends up being on those who have access to it and not the drastic number of Americans that don't. And the fact that even today in a place like Massachusetts that is so proud of the healthcare industry that we have invested in and that we have nurtured, that a story that ran in the Boston Globe about eight months ago, about a year ago, about an African-American woman who slipped and fell in a minority part of Boston, broke her wrist, got in a cab and went to Boston Medical Center, the old city hospital. She broke her wrist out in front of or down the block from New England Baptist. It's where the Boston Celtics go to get an orthopedic surgery. She didn't even know that the hospital was there. And even if she did, it wouldn't have mattered because it's a private hospital and they don't take Medicaid. But when we have, when Medicaid shifting gears is the largest payer of mental behavioral health services in this country, and the vast majority of providers won't take Medicaid because the reimbursement rates are so low, yes, if I can afford to pay out of pocket, I have access. But for so many others that don't, they don't. Mr. Morley would not be here. But for the grace of God of Affordable Care Act and the fact that certainly, I mean, Mr. Morley, you've been eloquent about your story, but how many people in this country, how many people are we even forced to have to tell your story? Honestly, I've lost track. I really, it's, I mean, it, it, I, I will never understand why we all can't just work together to bring that access for everyone. And so uh, my time is up here. I, I will just say this. This is complex and this is complicated and there are trade-offs. 
But the core question here is that for a system that every single one of us will draw on, whether you were born into a system or whether you watch a, welcome a new child or watch a loved one pass through it, why would we not want to make sure that the system is there for everyone else, the same system that we want for a loved one? I yield back. Could I add one comment to that? That's up to Would the I chair. be allowed? Well, I think we need to move along um, because it's 24 minutes past, um, or 20, yeah, seconds past uh, uh, the gentleman's time. Uh, I now would like to recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Ross, we try to get along on this committee. If you've got something short, say it. Thank you. It's, just, it's very difficult for me to hear the comparisons to other countries, single payers, with the constant comment that people are, are dying and denied care. As long as the for-profit motive is present in this country, that's what's happening now. The only way for them to get, make their profit is to deny care. Well, and, and, I, and I don't necessarily agree with you on that and would, would take exception, but we do try to be courteous on this committee and try to work together. That being said, Dr. Atlas, too many rural ho today many rural hospitals are closing because they cannot afford to stay in business, leading to access problems for sick Americans. One of the major reasons for these closures is, is that Medicare, and Mr. Kennedy mentioned Medicaid, doesn't pay hospitals enough. According to MedPAC, hospitals are unable to make money caring make money caring for Medicare patients. If it wasn't for privately insured patients, even more hospitals in rural communities would close. Research by the consulting firm Navigant predicts that a Medicare, that a Medicare public option plan would put up to 55% of rural hospitals at high risk for closure. Now, I say this with the backdrop that my rural western Commonwealth of Virginia district has lost two hospitals in the last few years. We're trying to get one of them back. But many of the plans we are discussing today involve expanding Medicare. If more patients are covered by government health care, won't that lead to even more rural hospital closures and access problems? Well, absolutely, of course. Like I said before, uh, the CMS actuary uh, put out the statistic that, and in fact, a statement that we expect access to Medicare participating physicians to become a significant issue quote unquote, and the reason is because Medicaid and Medicare pay not just lower than private insurance, but below the costs of delivering the care. That's the point. And so it brings you back to uh, what, what I believe is the whole solution that should be the focus, which is the reducing the cost of care without needing to limit or restrict the use of care. If you reduce the cost of care, everybody gets access, including those on government programs. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And, and I guess, you know, the question is begged, how can we guarantee access to care for patients in rural areas under Medicare for All plan if there are no open hospitals in rural communities? And for those who haven't heard me say this before, sometimes you look at a map and point A to point B doesn't look like it's very far, but when you have a mountainous district like I do, it, it may be Hayside of Dickinson, the mayor of Hayside, plans on an hour if he's going to a meeting in Dickinson for travel time. And the same is true when we closed down the Scott County Hospital. That meant a minimum of, of 45 minutes to an hour for many of the people in Scott County to get to the nearest hospital just for basic stuff, not even counting something that might be more complex. But uh, how can we guarantee that those folks are actually going to have care? It's not like getting in a cab and going to the next hospital down the road. There is no hospital down the road. Well, that, that's the, the, again, the solution is to introduce the, uh, the, the forces that bring down the prices for every other good or service in the United States. That's how you ensure access, not just based on price, but based on value or quality. Dr. Holtzee, can you anything to add to that? I think that's the essence of it. I don't think anyone's here to defend the status quo. The question is, how can you go forward and what set of reforms would deliver a downward pressure on delivering the cost of quality care? I appreciate it. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Actually, you know, the uh, GAO a uh, analyzed data and found that rural hospitals in states that had expanded uh, Medicaid as of April 2018 were less likely to close compared with rural hospitals in states that uh, had not expanded Medicaid. So uh, we deal with a lot of complexities, and, uh, uh, but I think the, uh, th these, th the facts need to be stated so that um, uh, 
you know, that we build on the foundation of facts. And um, it seems to me that we're in an era where um, that foundation continues to be eroded on a daily basis. So uh, it's a pleasure to recognize the gentleman from California, my friend, Mr. Cardenas, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the opportunity to have this hearing and also to the ranking member Burgess, thank you so much. And uh, I wanna say thank you for pointing out that statement that when the politicians take the politics out of their decision making, more people have access to health care under the current system, which you just pointed out with certain states not accepting that responsibility and opportunity. I appreciate the opportunity to hear from my colleagues and other experts such as yourselves, thank you very much, on what it is um, most important of the issues facing our nation. I'm proud to serve on a committee that does not shy away from topics simply because they're difficult. And I myself know what it is to grow up in a family, a working family, where my parents faced the choice between going to the doctor or having enough food to feed their family. A choice that too many American families face today. Uh, to say that the establishment of federally qualified health centers changed our lives uh, is an understatement. For the first time, we could get preventative care. Uh, we could go to the doctor when we first started feeling sick instead of when it was a dire emergency. The Affordable Care Act provided these same opportunities for more than 20 million Americans that before then did not truly have access to health care. Many of them are, uh, live in the very district that I'm proud to serve. Although I was not uh, yet a member of this committee when the Affordable Care Act passed the House, I know many of my colleagues were. I think most of my Democratic colleagues are united in our firm belief that all Americans deserve access to quality health coverage. Uh, together, it's imperative that we continue that work because while many Americans have benefited from these reforms, there are still too many without care. And that's why it is so important that we're having this hearing today and discussing this very uh, critical issue. Um, Mr. Atlas, um, when it, some of the comments that were made, and you, in fact, pointed out that some hospitals are closing. Hospitals closing, is that a new phenomenon in the United States, or have we had that happen over the past decades? Hospitals closing and or every American having access to health care. Are those two new phenomenons? Do all Americans have access to health care today? Uh, it, it, well, it's illegal to turn somebody away when they come yeah. to the hospital. Okay, you know, so, so okay. The, the I'm sorry, let, let me qualify my question a little bit better. How many Americans actually have health care coverage and direct access to preventative care today, 100% or not? Well, everyone with insurance has free preventive care. Does that cover 100% of Americans? Uh, no, not, okay. not everybody opts for, for insurance. Okay, got it. And, okay. Uh, Thank you, I, Mr. Ellis, uh, reclaiming my time. I was okay. trying to have a nice dialogue with you and, and a simple one, but you're complicating the answer. Bottom line is this. In the United States of America, we've 100% of Americans have never had truly access to health care. Just like I outlined during a period of time in my family's history when I was growing up, we truly didn't have access to health care, preventative care, excuse me. Today, Americans don't. Before the Affordable Care Act, we never were at 100%. During the Affordable Care Act, the new system, we're not at 100%. Hospitals have closed and opened, et cetera, over the history of time in the United States of America. My point is this. What I don't appreciate is when members of Congress try to point out that today's system is the worst that it's been, and that's just not true. We have an, a system that needs improvement. That is true. We have a system that's trying to get more working families and every family and every child more access to health care. And to me, that's what the core of this hearing is about today. How do we improve our system? How do we get to a better system where it, the percentages go up and the individuals and the families and the children truly have access to real health care, preventative care, et cetera? Um, I, I hate to point out that an emergency room cannot turn somebody down. That's a conversation for another day. I hope we never have to narrow ourselves to that conversation. So the main thing that I think this hearing is about today is how can we, as elected members of Congress in the House of Representatives, the People's House, how can we advance some legislation 
that will bring us to a better state, a better place, where more Americans can appreciate the fact that they can live through a health care situation instead of die because of non-access to health care. That is at the core of what this hearing is about, and I really do appreciate uh, all of you coming forward. Mr. Morley, thank you so much for your bravery of coming forth before all of us and letting us know that no one should suffer through what you've had to suffer through. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, uh, and Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bill Arrakis, for his five minutes Thank questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it so much. Uh, Dr. Uh, Holtz Egan, uh, does Medicare for All repeal Obamacare? That's the first question. Yes. Okay. If so, why would Democrats now support to repeal Obamacare? You will have to ask them. I don't know. Okay. Could this be taken as an admission of Obamacare's failure to make health care more affordable and more accessible through increased government intervention and mandates? Um, I, again, I would direct you to the authors. Okay. Uh, let, me, uh, let, me, let me ask you this. Can it be guaranteed that taxes will not be raised on the middle class to pay for Medicare for all or that individual's uh, and families will not lose coverage under Medicare for All, or that seniors' benefits will not be changed or reduced. Uh, of course, you know, Medicare Advantage is very popular in my district. About 40% of uh, Medicare recipients are on Medicare Advantage, and we've got to protect Medicare Advantage and, and Medicare for seniors in general. Uh, so that's what my main concern is uh, our seniors uh, that are on Medicare now traditional Medicare, but also Medicare Advantage, uh, can they, could they be affected by this Medicare for All bill? Uh, the bill would eliminate Medicare, uh, Medicare Advantage included, um, so that would be gone, so would Medicaid. Um, it would eliminate private insurance, so those uh, individuals would definitely be affected. The bill is silent on financing the costs, which are substantial. Uh, I personally believe, having looked at a variety of these, that it's implausible to imagine that, that that taxpayer cost could be picked up by a small subset of affluent Americans is simply too big a number. Okay, so when you say uh, the Medicare for all, uh, do you feel that the reimbursement uh, would be cut uh, for hospitals, doctors and nurses, uh, et cetera, healthcare providers in general? Uh, reimbursements would be cut to, to Medicare reimbursement rates and some variations slightly uh, above that, which is well below the average of what they get now from commercial players. and. This would produce financial stresses, and those would be solved by either diminishing access and quality or by raising uh, the reimbursements and the taxes necessary to finance it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Atlas, does Medicare for All lead to government rationing? If so, why? Well, the purpose of Medicare for All, uh, as other single-payer systems, uh, part of it is going to be controlling costs, and the way that controls costs uh, is certainly not by letting people be price sensitive, it eliminates concern for price. So yes, the only way to control cost in the single payer systems is to restrict care, and that means rationing of care, yes. That's okay. proven all over the world. Yeah, well give me a specific country uh, where that takes place, the rationing, please. Well, the United Kingdom, Canada, every Western European, uh, you know, Denmark, Netherlands, Italy, France, everywhere. Okay, thank you very much, I appreciate the answer. Uh, this is uh, very dear to my heart. The, I'm co-chair of the Rare Disease uh, Caucus. Increasing, increasing access to breakthrough cures and treatments, again, are one of my priorities. And I'm sure the entire committee, both Democrats and Republicans, uh, that's one of their priorities as well. How would Medicare for All impact patients with rare diseases, in your opinion, Dr. Atlas? Well, I think that there is sort of an indirect uh, longer-term problem with single-payer systems, and that is they don't just control the cost by restricting access to things like new drugs. I mean, the drugs, uh, dr new drugs are the basis for the new survivals for these rare diseases, generally speaking. Uh, but they also are going to inhibit innovation, because if you're reducing the costs by restricting the use and restricting the upside of developing new technology and new drugs, the, the goods are not produced. That's just a fact. Okay, thank you very much. Madam Chair, uh, I, if no one else wants my time, uh, I'll yield back, and I do appreciate you holding this hearing 
and then allowing us to, to ask the questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to yield if you'd like, please. Put your microphone on, please. I was looking right at you, Ms. Ross, so, uh, and you were shaking your head. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to respond to my colleague's uh, question or comments. Well, obviously, we're not proponents of denying care to people. We're, we're proponents of making sure that everybody gets them. There's been a lot of discussion about the rural hospitals, very near and dear to our hearts, too. You're right. The main reason is the non-expansion of Medicaid, but the other is the for-profit motives of private employers, hospital corporations that come in, and they opt for a model that will serve them better, make them more money, so they close off services that people in those communities really need, and they move them to other pe places so that our patients cannot get the care that they need that they once were able to. So Medicare for All actually has globalized budgets, and it has a budget for special projects, which ensures that those rural hospitals and others will be built and opened. The gentleman yield back. Yes. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize uh, uh, from California, Dr. Ruiz, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you very much for having this hearing, this very, very important hearing, and I'm so happy that we're now presenting a variety of different options that can move the healthcare system in America forward because uh, I truly believe, and I know many of us in this room believe, that uh, every American should get the care they need when they need it at an affordable low cost. And that should be our goal. Our goal in order to achieve that should be universal coverage. Everybody should have coverage. And we, that is how we should, one, look at our efforts, and two, making sure that out-of-pocket costs are low for people, for patients. Uh, Ms. Ross, you, you and I are made from the same fabric because we've worked in the emergency departments, and so we know what it means to fight for people, for our patients, and put them at the very center of our universe. Uh, and, you know, we made some progress. The ACA went a long way in moving us towards that goal. In fact, because of the ACA, over 20 million individuals are now insured. Let, let, let me just remind people that being uninsured is a health risk. Some may say, how can that be? I tell you straight up, it's a health risk. Because if you don't have insurance, you can't afford, you can't afford your medicine if you get sick and you will get sicker and you will present to the emergency department if you make it with ICU type level care and your ability to recuperate is even worse. So yes, being uninsured is a risk factor, health risk factor, and you can die for not being able to pr prevent certain illnesses. So this is of important urgency for all of us we can see the benefits of Medicaid expansion when we look at expansion states versus non-expansion states. In terms of the providers and the hospitals, if you just expanded Medicaid in those states that could expand Medicaid but for political reasons chose not to, you would reduce the uninsured rate by 5% just by that alone. So, but unfortunately the ACA has not been fully implemented there's been a lot of changes since then to make it worse because the number one singular goal of the, of, you know, the Republican Party since Obama uh, passed this was to destroy it, to sabotage it, so to then say, see, it's not working at the expense of the American people's health. And so what are our next steps? You know, well, definitely we need to stabilize the market. We need to reduce overall health care costs. And then we got to look at adding some provisions that would increase the ability for Americans to have coverage and therefore to eliminate the uninsured problem, health risks of the American people here. Um, so, Professor Rosenbaum, you know, there are a variety of federal public option plans that we have looked at today to accomplish universal coverage. And I know the specifics of how we do that varies, but can you talk generally about the benefits of adding a public option to our current system, specifically 
Uh, is there research to suggest that a public option will increase competition, lower costs? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I do believe that adding a, a strong public option uh, both gives people access in communities that right now are poorly served by private insurance plans um, and by injecting additional competition into the system helps stabilize uh, uh, the cost of care and keep it under control. Uh, well, you know, the thing we have to focus here is that we need a preferential option. We need a pref not just any option. We need a preferential option. And when you look at health insurance, you want to make sure that it is expansive and protects you and c will cover what you need to be covered. And let's, I'm an emergency medicine doctor, so there's nobody who's immune to accidents. Nobody's immune to that unfortunate surprise diagnosis that you get that you never thought you would ever get, like cancers and whatnot. So we need to make sure that it's affordable and that it's, can cover as, as many ailments uh, that, that we need to protect patients. In addition to that, uh, we must address a, a couple of, of other issues, and one is the provider shortage that we have in our country. We, we, we need to. We don't have enough nurses. We don't have enough doctors. And we need to also look at the delivery of our healthcare system and where we focus our resources for prevention and public health, not on expensive end of life kind of care, but the prevention and the public health at the beginning. Thank you. And the gentleman yields back. Yields back. That's right. Uh, a pleasure to recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Hudson, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate you holding this hearing today. I thank the witnesses for your time uh, being with us today. Uh, while I support the broad goals, of all the pieces of legislation we're considering today, uh, which is to expand access to affordable health coverage. Uh, I have grave concerns with the impacts these bills would have on real people who need to access our health care system. And Madam Chair, my friend from California uh, just finished speaking, and he is in, in truly my friend. Uh, but I have to disagree with his characterization that Republicans want to destroy the health care system to score some political point. I, I think everyone in this room wants to make this system better, wants to make it more affordable. Um, and, and I think the, the, the question is, how do we get there? Uh, first, uh, broadly speaking, the population we're trying to help is roughly 28 million Americans uh, who cannot afford insurance or who've decided not to purchase insurance. By comparison, 293 million Americans do have insurance, which is a little more than nine out of every 10 people in this country are insured. Medicare is already going broke. The program currently covers roughly 44 million people in this country. Under Medicare for All, it would have to cover 327 million people. That's seven times the size it currently covers. To think that we could add seven times uh, more people to the Medicare program without a cut in benefits defies common sense. Second, we'd also be eliminating an entire segment of our economy and giving providers a massive pay cut. I shudder to think what would happen to access to care in rural areas of my district, which are already hamstrung. For example, Montgomery County in my district there's only one psychiatrist and only two part-time psychiatrists for the entire county. Any further cuts in benefits or pay rates would exacerbate this problem. Dr. Atlas, you spoke at length in your testimony uh, about the quality of care in this country compared to other countries, including wait times experienced by those patients. Have you ever studied the private systems that exist alongside the public system in those countries, such as in Canada or Great Britain? And if so, can you speak to who has access to these private systems? Yes, there's an increasing trend in countries with single payer, specifically uh, the UK as a, as a florid example, but also all the other countries of Western Europe, that people with money opt out of the system, even, or not opt out, they pay their taxes, but they then supplement. They, there's, a, there's a significant increase in buying private insurance, significant increase in paying out of pocket, and they all avoid using their single payer system of the people who are affluent enough to do it. And that was my point, that the only people stuck with the single payer system are the very people that everybody in this room wants to help, the low income people. So in single payer countries, the average taxpayer has to wait while wealthy customers don't have to. Uh, uh, they, they can see a doctor immediately. Well, that's exactly right. There's a parallel system basically in the UK 
as there is here really with the Medicaid system, which everybody in this room probably knows, has worse outcomes than comparable patients with private insurance. To celebrate an expansion of Medicaid when no one in Congress would want that coverage for their family, I find a little bit unconscionable. Medicaid has worse outcomes from surgery, cancer, heart procedures, lung transplants, than the same patients with private insurance because of the restrictive uh, access to technology and drugs that Medicaid covers. Well, My plan is to make Medicaid money go for a bridge toward private insurance. We want everybody in the country to have excellence to the ac access to the excellence of American health care, not a separate parallel pathway for poor people. Well, I agree. It doesn't sound fair to have one system for the wealthy and a different one for those who aren't. Uh, <laughs> you also testified that the trend in single-payer countries is moving towards private options for health insurance to supplement or even completely circumvent the government-run system. Uh, why do you think it is, and, and should it be instructive for us as we examine these extreme proposals um, looking forward? What is the question? I didn't hear it. Um, it. Well, just to continue on the thought, you're saying that that uh, that for the folks who can afford it, private insurance options are supplementing or replacing it. Um, and, and maybe you've answered it already, but but why do you think this phenomenon is happening um, in these other countries? That the wealthy go to a separate system and everybody else is stuck in in, in the because the government. single payer coverage restricts care. And as we see in the United States, we can expand Medicaid all we want but Medicaid is not accepted by more than half of doctors, including doctors who have signed contracts to accept Medicaid according to HHS data. So you label someone as insured, but that's not the same as having access to care. Great, well, as my time's expiring, Madam Chair, I'll yield back, thank you. Gentleman yields back. I just wanna add, Dr. Atlas, what you said about Medicaid, uh, Mr. Morley would not be alive were it not for it. Yeah, now I'm we'd talking like about to, data, um, not individuals. Well. <laughs> I'm talking about the, the data in the medical literature. So that doesn't include Dr. Uh, Mr. No, it Morley? does. I'm thrilled he's here. Yeah, I mean, we all are. Fantastic. And we, and we have many Mr. Morleys in our country. Uh, the chair would now would like to uh, uh, recognize the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Barrigan, for her five minutes of questions. Thank you. Um, there was this conversation about the one system for the wealthy and one for the poor. Um, hello? It's on. Testing? Uh, so there was a conversation about a system for the wealthy and a system for the poor. That's actually very much describes what we have happening in this country. Um, you have, <laughs> it wor it, it's even worse. You have people who don't have access to any care at all. And so this is the problem, and this is why we need to figure out how to get to universal care, because access to health care is a human right. Everybody should have access to it. Now, I represent a district um, that's a majority-minority district. It's almost 90% Latino African American, and it's very working class. Uh, one of my colleagues likes to hand out a list of where your congressional district lies uh, by income. Mine is 358 out of 435. People are struggling, and people don't have access to health care. Now, the ACA was a step in the right direction. It did help increase access to health care. But there are still a lot of people who are left behind, still a lot of people who don't have that access. And some people who may have something, they get duped into buying some of these junk plans, and then they realize they really don't have coverage. And so um, I want to thank the panelists for being here today and for this conversation. Um, Ms. Ross, I want to thank you for your work. My sister is a nurse, um, and I know that you have been on the front lines of fighting for uh, Medicare for All and making sure that everybody has access to health care. And I think the bottom line is we can probably all agree that everybody should have access to health care, and the disagreement happens to be on how we get there. Um, and I mentioned to you the district, make the makeup of my district. Can you explain um, what the benefit would be to communities of color um, if we had Medicare for All and how the bill would reduce minority health disparities? I think I would point to, again, what I talked about with the, how it's administered, the globalized budgets. There would be um, negotiations between the hospital 
and the regional directors, and you would look at what you need for the following year, looking at what you needed for the year before, for one thing. And then you would project, so if you knew you had rural hospitals, uh, communities that are under, underserved, and you needed more staff in those hospitals, maybe you needed to build a hospital. Those are the kinds of things you would look at putting into the budget so that people had, who had previously been unserved and underserved would be able to get care. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Ross, um, in addition to being a registered nurse, you are also a national union leader as the president of the largest union of registered nurses in the country. We often hear politicians telling us that Medicare for All would be bad for union members and that unions wouldn't support it. But your union does support Medicare for All, as do many national and local unions across the country. Ms. Ross, can you tell us why do unions support this bill? Well, right now there's at least 9.3 million unions that represent union workers that, that do, um, do want Medicare for all. And I, I think if you look back at our history, we're to the point now where we can't negotiate anymore um, for better wages and working conditions, pension benefits, because everything is taken up with bargaining for health care. If you look at most of the strikes across the country in the last several years, they've all been over health care benefits. So I think we see the handwriting on the wall. And also, I know union workers who might like to switch jobs, but they're afraid to because they've got their insurance tied to their employer. Thank you. Um, Mr. Morley, thank you for your advocacy. You are on the Hill all the time, um, and you're very active on social media, and you're telling the sto your story and uh, telling people about how important it is for us to, to fight on health care. Something that I'm proud Democrats have been doing um, and have been working on a bipartisan basis um, to, to make sure we find solutions as best we can under current conditions. Mr. Morley, is there um, anything you want to share with us, uh, any considerations you, you want to tell us about any of the bills before us today? I just, uh, is it on? No. no. I, I just want to say uh, I really think it's so important for, um, I'd love to see more of a bipartisan effort. Um, there was no need to bring up anything about HR3 today because this is not an HR3 hearing, so that makes me kind of angry. Uh, so any and all bills that will get us towards coverage, increase our coverage for all Americans is what I'm trying to achieve as a, as a patient and for all the patients that have reached out to me through social media. That's all I've ever wanted. And to protect the protections for pre-existing conditions that are already in place, the expanded Medicaid, the, uh, the ways that the ACA's helped Medicare, that's all I've ever wanted. And I don't want to see those protections removed. Great. Thank you all for your work. I yield back. The gentlewoman uh, yields back. Uh, uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Montana, Mr. Gianforte. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is a very important hearing for the future of our country. I appreciate the panelists being here. Uh, Medicare is critical to Montana's, Montana's seniors. Uh, we should work to protect these benefits that they've earned. I believe the federal government must honor the commitment it made to our seniors. But Medicare for all will destroy Medicare as we know it. Uh, to a casual observer, Medicare for all sounds appealing on its face, but it's really just a marketing gimmick. To dig deeper beyond the slick marketing efforts of a catchy name, Medicare for All is nothing more than a government-run, single-payer payer healthcare system. It would end Medicare as we know it and leave our seniors in the cold. Medicare for All in practice is Medicare for none. Now some of my Democrat colleagues will claim Medicare for All is a proposal out of a fringe, out-of-touch wing of the Democrat Party. But the truth is, it's taken over the Democrat Party by storm. Many Democrats jockeying for the presidency in 2020 support Medicare for All, and half of the Democrats in the House have co-sponsored Medicare for All. Let's be clear, Medicare for All would gut Medicare, end the VA for our veterans, and force 225,000 Montana seniors who rely on Medicare to the back of the line. Montana seniors have earned these benefits, 
and lawmakers shouldn't undermine Medicare and threaten health care coverage of Montana seniors. Medicare for all would devastate rural health care. We've heard that on the committee today, especially those in Montana. They already face overwhelming challenges. Since 2010, more than 100 rural hospitals have closed their doors, and nearly 40 percent of all rural hospitals operate on a budget shortfall. Under Medicare for All, hospitals in Montana would take a 40 percent payment reduction. Hospitals in our rural areas would struggle further, and patients would lose access entirely to critical providers, like oncologists and heart surgeons. Medicare for All will lead to worse access to care in our rural communities. In addition to gutting Medicare and eliminating access to care in our rural communities, Medicare for All is a fiscally irresponsible budget buster. Elizabeth Warren, a front runner in the Democrat primary, has proposed Medicare for All that would cost $52 trillion. With a straight face, she campaigns that her plan, plan will not raise taxes on the middle class. I don't believe that. It doesn't pass the reasonability test. Medicare for all would terrify Americans who rely on Medicare and who like their employer and, and who like their employer sponsored plans. Under Medicare for all, private insurance would be banned. Folks, this is a government takeover of health care, plain and simple. We are not a socialist country. Medicare for all will gut Medicare and the VA as we know it and put Montana seniors at the back of the line. To force 225,000 Montanans who rely on Medicare to share their pool with everyone isn't fair to Medicare seniors, Montana seniors. In reality, Medicare for all is Medicare for none. Instead of a reckless government takeover of our health care system, we should take a bipartisan approach to fix our broken health care system. We should protect patients with pre-existing conditions, increase transparency and choice, preserve rural access to care, and lower costs. Let's get to work on that and end this socialist charade. Now, Dr. Atlas, um, as I said earlier, it seems like our rural providers will struggle under a Medicare for All proposal. What do you believe will happen to rural hospitals and other providers under Medicare for All? Well, under a single-payer uh, system where private insurance is banned, we already know that Medicare pays less than the cost of delivering the care. They serve, these hospitals survive because of the extra reimbursement they get from the private insurers. So it's, so, it's very naive to think that, oh, we're just going to wipe out private insurance and have the Medicare payments support all these hospitals. The hospitals will go out of business just like the CMS actuary said in 2018. Okay, uh, Mr. At Dr. Atlas, would you agree that this legislation and bills like it would also require taxpayers to fund elective abortion with no limitation? I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, how would you rate, well, with that, uh, Madam Chair, I, I'm glad we're having this hearing today. It's very important for the American people that we preserve access to quality care and get costs down. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to thank the panel. Um, excuse me. First of all, I want to push back um, pretty hard on the doomsday scenario that is being painted by uh, some of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, which to me amounts to fear-mongering. Uh, there's a lot of distortions of, of what the cost of the Medicare for All proposal would be. These um, scenarios about what would happen to hospitals, rural hospitals, the fact of the matter is that under the current Medicare and Medicaid programs, there's a lot of um, investment, and that's what it is, that goes into those kinds of um, hospitals and uh, delivery systems. And so if you had a Medicare for All system, I think you would continue to see that kind of investment. It's not like we would just walk away from these critical parts of our delivery uh, system. So that has to be accounted for when we're having this uh, discussion. The thing about the Medicare for All proposal, and there's many that have been presented, they all have different merits, is to me it's, 
it's the most honest in the sense that I think that's where we're going to land ultimately. The fact of the matter is Americans like Medicare. They like Medicaid. They like um, uh, the veteran's health care system. They've basically already made a judgment that these systems that are delivered and led out of the public sector are ones um, that give them a sense of confidence about their, uh, their health care. And so I think that it's just a matter of time before we get to a place where we have a Medicare for all system. As, as Representative Jayapal described it, it's got the three things you want. It's got universal coverage and access, so everybody is covered. It's got a comprehensive set of benefits so that people understand that when they need to see a doctor, they need to go to the hospital, they need to get care, that that is going to be available to them. And it eliminates the, the wasteful um, overhead uh, and the predatory practices of the health insurance industry, which have inflicted a lot of suffering on people for, for decades now. So that's what Americans want. That's where we're going to be, ultimately. The discussion that we're having, we're seeing it play out, even in sort of the presidential sweepstakes, um, is how do you transition? How quickly do you get there? I think there's an appetite to get there as quickly as we can. Um, and that's being discussed, and it's part of what I think are very robust and meaningful and carefully executed analyses of the Medicare for All plan that have been put forward. So it doesn't help things to just engage in this kind of knee-jerk um, denigration of Medicare for All, pulling out of thin air uh, some of these uh, numbers, predictions, um, and fear-mongering. That's not a constructive contribution to the discussion. Now, um, I wanted to ask um, Ms. Ross, I now have a minute and a half left because I couldn't stop talking. Um, but there's uh, Maryland just, uh, there's just a report released by CMS about Maryland's all-payer model, which includes global budgeting. And it did show that when you, when you put global budgeting in place, um, in that instance, you were reducing Medicare expenditures by 2.8%, hospital expenditures by 4.1%, reducing admissions um, and avoidable hospitalizations. And I was just curious to get your perspective on kind of global budgeting. Obviously, many of the proposals included here, Medicare for All as well, incorporates conceptually this idea of, of more global budgeting. And so if you could speak to um, how that would uh, promote transparency, uh, potentially lower costs, um, and benefit patients in underserved and vulnerable communities, if you think that kind of approach would achieve those things. I do indeed, and it, it's, I think we're lucky that we have the example of Maryland because it's worked so well there. For those who might not know, uh, Maryland started their, what amounts to global budgeting in 2010, and they started with rural hospitals, and it was so successful, then they, they put in the rest of their hospitals, private and um, public. And what they found was, I've got some figures, the, their global budget saved Medicare as a payer over $420 million in just three years. And originally, their goal was to save $330 million over five years. So it was a, a whopping success. And from a nurse's perspective, what it does for, for patients is wonderful because it reduced infection rates, it improved care, it reduced readmission rates. And those I need to things interrupt. Uh, you know, the gentleman's time Thanks very has much. expired, and we have votes on the floor. I just want to inform members that the, the members that are not part of the subcommittee I don't think are going to have the opportunity. I would stay were it not for the fact that we have votes on the floor. So uh, where is Ms. Dingle? Is Kelly. she here? Ms. Kelly. All right. Well, I'm going to call on uh, uh, Ms. Kelly from the state of Illinois for her five minutes. And if uh, Ms. Dingle comes back, I'll take her. But then we're going to have to um, close the hearing. So uh, the gentlewoman from Illinois is recognized for her five minutes. Thank you all for your testimony today and your uh, patience. Um, 
One thing I have to say, you know, we worked hard on, I wasn't here, but my colleagues worked hard on the Affordable Care Act, and I don't think there's a Democrat that would say that was a perfect bill. But a lot of people that didn't have coverage received coverage, but as we know, there's still about 27 and a half million people that don't have the coverage. But when I came here, instead of spending time and time and time trying to repeal the bill, uh, we should have been working on how we could make it better. But all we faced was a wall, and I think we voted to repeal it 63 plus times. So, um, you know, let's be honest about, you know, what happened. And then there was the trifecta of Republicans, Senate, House, and the President, and uh, we still didn't improve uh, health care in this nation. Um, I am the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust, so I'm very concerned about the disparities in health uh, for minorities. We, when it comes to morbidity and mortality, I mean, we lead the cause. I had a bill, uh, the Mamas Act, that dealt with maternal mortality. Uh, be, and as you, some of you know, black women die three to four times the rate of white women. I had a bill that would take the Medicaid coverage to a year instead of two months, but I could not get one Republican on that bill, even though we talk about, um, you know, we don't want two different uh, healthcare systems for the poor and for the rich, but then when we have the opportunity, we don't do it. Now we got a bill out, but we had to water it down. Now, uh, Ms. Rosenbaum, you mentioned the need for coordination across healthcare, public health, education, and job development service systems. Could you expand upon this and explain what are the ways to address disparities and improve community health aside from increasing access to care, which we all know is needed? Yes. Um, I'd like to actually begin by uh, uh, disagreeing with Dr. Atlas. I think the infant mortality problem in the United States is very real. Uh, it is not simply a matter of numbers and how we count. Uh, and it's made all the more real by the terrible disparities uh, on the basis of race and income. Uh, I think it's very important to couple any health coverage reform legislation with provisions that do the kinds of things that the Brain Trust has been mm -hmm. such an advocate for, uh, which is bulking up public health, uh, bringing health care providers under sort of a broader public health umbrella, making sure that part of the health care experience is care management to be able to get better access to the kinds of services and interventions that we commonly call the social determinants at this point, uh, uh, making sure that when you walk in the door for health care, you not only have good health care, but you have access to nutrition, to housing assistance, uh, to the other things that make people healthy. Uh, the Affordable Care Act actually did a good job of starting that process of bridging between health and health care. Uh, the community health center expansion is, of course, incredibly important. The public health trust fund was important, and I think it's absolutely key that the Black Caucus continue as it was. It was the leader on those kinds of equity measures that it continued to lead on these issues. Thank you, and because of time, I'll yield back. The gentlewoman uh, yields back, and do we have anyone else? Is Ms. Uh, Ms. Jane will leave? Yes, we're good. Yeah. All right, uh, I'm going to um, uh, place um, in the record of the following documents, an article from the Century Foundation, Health Reform's North Star, report from the Century Foundation, Road to Universal Coverage, Coalition Letter from Advocates for Youth et al., a letter from NAACP et al. regarding Medicare for All, letter from the Fraternal Order of Police in support of H.R. 4527, letter from the International Association of Firefighters in support of H.R. 4527, letter from the Healthcare Leadership Council, statement from the American Nurses Association, and the statement from uh, Representative uh, Cedric uh, uh, Richmond and a statement from BCBS of California, as well as the documents that uh, Congressman Shimkus uh, asked uh, uh, to be entered in the record. Uh, hearing no objections, uh, so ordered. We recognize the gentleman uh, from Virginia for uh, his additions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I ask unanimous consent to include the following into the record. I understand these documents have been shared previously with the majority. 
There will be statements from the American Hospital Association, America's Health, Plan, Health Insurance Plans, Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, Chamber of Commerce, Partnership for America's Healthcare Future, Partnership for Employer Sponsored Coverage, Texas Hospital Association, March for Life Letter, National Right to Life, Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, Susan B. Anthony List, American Action Forum, American Hospital Association, Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, Heritage Foundation, Mercatus Center, Partnership for America's Healthcare Future, Polling from Partnership for America's Healthcare Future, News Articles and Op Eds from The Hill, The Washington Post. One pagers from Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, Congressional Pro Life Caucus, Partnership for America's Healthcare Future, and Partnership for Employer Sponsored Coverage. Thank you, Madam Chair. So ordered. Uh, uh, all members uh, pursuant to committee rules uh, have 10 business days to submit additional questions uh, for the record uh, to be answered by the witnesses uh, who have appeared today. And I ask each witness to. Uh, respond as promptly as possible to any questions that are submitted to you. Uh, before I uh, uh, gavel the uh, adjournment of the subcommittee, uh, I want to thank each one of you. Uh, you've taken a great deal of your time, put a great deal of effort into your written testimony. Uh, each one of you has the passion that you've brought to the witness table. You've traveled to come to be with us. I thank each one of you. At the beginning of this year, as uh, uh, when my colleagues elected me the chairwoman, the question was asked, will you have a hearing on Medicare for all? And I said that I would. Uh, no one had to twist my arm off for it. Um, this subcommittee has been the most produ productive subcommittee of the Energy and Commerce Committee. So uh, it may be December that we're having this hearing, but we have taken up major legislation all year long. Uh, and that was appropriate, and now uh, this hearing. So I thank all the advocates that have traveled to be with us. Thank you for your passion, for your big dreams. Keep it up. And uh, with that, uh, the subcommittee is adjourned. These are those documents. Yeah, OK, great. <laughs>